And a pleasant good evening to you all. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the infamous College of Complex. Oh, right, guys, give Tim your ear. Uh, uh, well. <laughs> Brown is going to be collecting money and will be moderating tonight. But the College of Complexes consists of a it's an open weekly free speech forum that's been around since 1951. For you newcomers, we only have two rules. Number one is one fool at a time, and number two is we have no personal attacks. Tonight we have Brother Joe, who is always a controversial and good speaker. Stand up, Brother Joe. He's friends with his brother. Huh? Since when you come with that brother? He's everybody's It's better than comrade. You're not going to call comrade. All right. We, we have a three parts. We start off with announcements, our main speaker, and then we have uh, infamous question and answer period. I think we, will, uh, we are now ready to start our speaker. Brother Joe, are you all set to go? Sure. Then, uh... Let's welcome Brother Joe and what it takes to be a part of your life's great strength. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why did Charlie call upon me to speak here today? What if I, or those I represent, to do with the 1% national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am, and am I, therefore, called upon to bring a humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings res resulting from those bosses independence to us? Would to God, both for our sakes and ours, and uh, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully re returned to these questions, that would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful? For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy cannot warm him? Who so absurd and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude have been torn from their limbs. I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might be eloquently speak and the lame man leap as a heart. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between the workers and the bosses. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. The boss's high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The inheritance of justice liberty and prosperity. The blessings in which the bourgeoisie this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, and prosperity and independence bequeathed by their fathers is shared by them, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to them has brought stripes and death to me. The 4th of July is theirs, not mine. They may rejoice, but I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems was in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking to me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct. Let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation, Babylon, whose crimes towering up to the heavens were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, bearing the nation in irreparable er, 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 ruin. Fellow citizens, above the national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains heavy and grievous today are today re rendered more intolerable by the jubilant shouts to reach them. If I do forget, I do not remember those bleeding children of sorrow of this day. May my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the, with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking that would make reproach before God in the world. My subject and fellow citizens is American wage slavery. I shall see this day as popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing here identified with the American bondsmen, 
making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on the 4th of July. Whether we turn to this declarations of the past or to professions of the present, the conduct of this nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slaves on this occasion, I will in the name of humanity, which is outraged in the name of liberty, which is fettered in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or is not at heart a slaveholder shall not convince to be right and just. But I fancy, I hear some of my audience say it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed do you have me argue? On uh, what branch of this subject do the people of this country need light? My, must I understand and pr prove that a slave is a man? That point is already conceded. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders acknowledge it in their enactment of laws of their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave, subject him to the punishment of death. Only two of these same crimes will be subject to a free man for punishment. What is this but acknowledgment that a slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that the southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read and write. When you can point to any such law in reference to the beasts of the field, may I consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your street, when the fowls in the air, When the cattle on your hills, with the fish in the sea, and the reptiles that crawl, shall be unable to distinguish a slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that a slave, uh, slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to, to affirm the equal manhood uh, of the slave. It is not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working with metals and brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, suffering, acting as clerks, merchants, secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that we are engaged in all enterprises, working at UPS, driving trucks, handling packages, you know, all that, digging gold in California, capturing the whales in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, above all, confessing and worshiping, Christian God, and looking hopefully for life, mortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he, that he is the rightful owner of his own body, that, that have already been declared? Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it settled by the rules and logic for argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principles of justice hard to understand? How should I look today in the presence of Americans, dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom, speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heavens who do not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue? That it is wrong to make man brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, keep them ignorant of their relationship to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with iron, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auctions, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them in obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employment of my time and strength as such arguments would apply. What then remains to be argued? Is that is slavery not divine that did, did uh, God not establish it? And our doctors have defended the mistaken? That is blasphemy thought. 
That which is unhuman cannot be divine. That, who can reason on such a proposition? They that can, I cannot. Time for argument is past. A time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nations here, I would talk today pour out a fiery stream, abiding ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the human tornado, and the earthquake. The feeling of a nation must be quickened. With conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be announced. What to the American wage slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and the cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boast of liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sound of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your shouts of liberty and equality hollow and mock. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception of piety and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up the crimes with disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of the practices more shocking and bloody than our, the, the United States at this very hour. Go search where you will. Roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, let your facts side by side of the everyday practice of this nation, you will say with me that without rival, for revolting barbarity, shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without rival. Or to quote Popeye, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. <laughs> this country was founded on slavery. The only thing that's changed is the form and degree. Uh, from the practice of indentured servitude to the uh, African slave trade, to, lay, to wage slavery that soon followed. The purpose was free labor. You know, so they tried to get as free much labor out of people as, as they possibly could. Slavery was the foundation of this country and still continues today. The only thing that changes is the shape and form of the slavery. The government and the corporations are the two tools of the 1% to enforce slavery upon the working folk. The corporations are the carrot, and the government is the stick. The other, um, so the way it works out is the supervisors are the economic enforcers on the job, and the police are the legal enforcers on the street. Neither of them are rich, are rich of themselves. They do the bidding of the rich. They serve and protect. The police serve and protect. The supervisors ser serve and protect. And who are they serving and protecting? It ain't you and me. They're, they're serving and protecting the capitalist class. The economic system is set up for you to have to sell your labor to the highest bidder. This is basically this is this is the economic draft. This economic system is set up for you to have to prostitute yourself. This economic system is set up that you have to work to make someone else rich to get your basic needs met. I mean, and I gotta, you know, I'm gonna digress myself. I mean, I'm gonna have to work 33 years at UPS, you know, to you know get my pension, get my health care so on and so forth. And that's better than most people can hope for in their life. And, and, the, and just that, you should have to work 30 some years to make someone else rich, give them that much of your life. And what this does, the system steals not just your money, the wealth that you create, your time, your very life essence, it steals from you the best years of your life. Another choice the system offers to be cannon, cannon fodder for the war machines. If you can't afford that higher education, if you can't find a job, they, once again, it goes back to the economic, economic draft, which the DREAM Act is another bait and switch. You know, um, it's uh, of the military industrial complex. Uh, for more information, you might want to see Eisenhower, Eisenhower's farewell speech. But what we got is a military industrial complex, and it just profits from their having war. It stays in, in, and it stays in place. And this uh, DREAM Act, you know, they, they, they say they're giving two options for people to gain their citizens. Either go in school or go in the military. But this is a set up for people to go into the military to be cannon fodder, excuse me, for this war machine. Because people are immigrants, most of them are poor, downtrodden, don't have the money. And this, this second avenue through schooling, they can uh, 
you know, get their citizenship. Well, they're not going to do it that way. They don't have the money to go to college. They're not providing any money, money for the people to go to college. So what it is is to siphon people, you know, the immigrants, into their war machine. You know, so uh, so if you refuse to be part of their lie, uh, they have a criminal justice system, or should I say, a prison industrial complex waiting for you. This is just another way. The slave masters break up families. This is just another way to blame the victim. This is just another way to make a buck off your physical body for the, um, for the for-profit prison system. It's set up just like the military industrial complex. They actually profit by locking people up in jail. It's a multi-billion dollar industry for profit. They get paid for taxpayers' money to have people in prison. So it's just one other system to take not just your wealth, Ukraine, because you know they might be working their factories there for really low wages, but to, to take your life's energy and take your life to profit off your life. So call it neoliberalism in the European sense of a word. Call it fascism, which is the collusion of corporations and government is a key aspect. Or call it wage slavery as the Fourth of July nears. I don't find it inappropriate, no reasonable person would. Now the laws are written by and for the ruling class. I went on for a long time about how the ideals of the Declaration of Independence is basically, you know, the ideals that America is supposed to live to. That's what live up to. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it means to me. But the problem is, they never intended none of those principles to come come for the working folk. You know, America is what it is. It's not what the principles they're supposed to live up to. It. America is what it is. And well, the people who wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence, the people who wrote the Constitution, were basically, you know, if you study it, they would, might be considered upper middle class, but they were slave owners. And they had no intention for women, uh, slaves, people of color, not, you know, not, not that it would make it all right, but they had no intention for white poor males that, you know, have the right to vote either. Not that it would be acceptable, they only had an intention for the rich people, rich white males to vote. That's where intention, when they wrote that, they had no intention to give everybody the right to vote or any of these, these freedoms and uh, liberties and declaration of independence or the constitution that came after. The only thing that will change things is struggle though. There's no change without it. So without further ado, I will begin talking about the struggles to end slavery in one shape or form or another in America. Bacon's Rebellion was a revolt by freemen, servants, and slaves in the colony of Virginia in 1676. It was against the richest one-seventh. Now we got the one percent, but back then it was the one-seventh richest folks. And the apparent uh, economic conditions they imposed on the poor and downtrodden. Now these conditions were caused by basically a divide and conquer tactic. What they did is they pushed the poor and downtrodden further west in the conflict with the Indians to create problems between them and the Indians. So, I mean, and that's how the, the one seventh won, by uh, creating a divide and conquer among the people having that revolt. And, and throughout, throughout that uh, issue of Bacon's Rebellion, that's where, where they, they created this divide and conquer in this country called uh, basically white privilege in this country. But basically to give white folk a few more crumbs with the threat of taking that away if, if white working folk don't step in line. And then exactly. human beings is being visual creatures. Now, that's the way they chose to divide people. In Europe, they tend to divide people by religion. And in the United States, they divide people by color. And like human beings are visual creatures. What, what is the most common sense that people, what's the number one sense people use? It's your vision, right? So everybody can see. You know, what's your second most used sense? It's also your vision. So, like for example, if you hear something in the thump of the night, do you start sniffing around? No, you're gonna turn and look. If you smell something funny, are you gonna listen for something? No, you're gonna look around and see what that might be causing that smell. So, so they, they use use that the visual to divide people by color of skin because that's. Uh, that's a surface difference that people can see because they're vi human beings are visual creatures. Okay, so now, so what they did is use divide and conquer, and that's that's a, it's going to be the tactic that they use in this country. I mean, that's well, that's how they they use divide and conquer throughout the ages. The Roman Empire divided different barbarian hordes, so on and so forth, against each other, and that's how they stayed as long as they did. But um, 
Now let's get uh, back to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the Declaration of Independence. Basically, meant the right for slave owners to steal the wealth, wealth that slaves created. That's what they meant by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to kill Crispus Attucks, the first casualty. The American Revolution was a man of color. The Bill of Rights is the boss's Bill of Rights. None of those rights apply to the worker on the job, which is the most important place to have rights. That's right. Even more important than your home. Because that is where, where you earn your bread and butter, where you can own your home, your car, the, for the food on your table. The rights on the job is more important than the rights in your own home. And basically, the Bill of Rights don't apply to the working folk. Why? Because this whole, this whole system is based on the rights to private property. And I could go on a whole, probably a whole speech about how corporations shouldn't have the right to property. I'm not against somebody having their own home, place to live, so on and so forth. But let's go over a couple of rights, uh, those rights shall we, the right to free speech. We have none of those on the job unless you have a union, and even then it is limited. This one also covers the freedom of assemble and associate. We did not get the right to legally to form a union until the National Labor Relations Act was passed, guaranteeing our legal right, which should have been procured by the Bill of Rights. Now, the bear, right to bear arms. Teamsters don't even have that right on the job. Could you imagine the changes in the workplace dynamic if the workers were armed? Yeah. Can you imagine the change? Can you imagine? Can you imagine uh, the bosses disrespecting the workers? Not to even mention for wrongful terminations. I mean, the probably the bosses would have a machine gun turret stationed in a high place in the workplace, but still, don't every every worker was you know carrying a nine millimeter or something like that. The change the whole way the, the workers are treated in the workplace. Yeah. Right. Let's go over a few of the, uh, the amendments. The First Amendment, religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. Like I said, we had to pass the National Labor Relations Act to guarantee our right to form a, form a union. And um, so the Second Amendment, right, the right to bear arms. We talked about that. You know, and we, we could go down the list, but uh, let me go jump to the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. Okay, another thing at UPS, they have this guard shack. And, um, you have to be searched, you know, to, to go into work. Most places that, most, well, my facility, they don't have it, but I go to all the facilities, and they have these guard shacks in most of the facilities. So they trust you enough to work there, but they have to search you coming in and going out. It's absolutely ridiculous. And guess who's uh, doing most of the stealing that's been caught? It's been management. You know, in the Harvey facility, it was management stealing phones. Yeah. The other facility, I just heard, you know, they're stealing, the management was stealing diamonds there. You know, and uh, so now, see, at one facility, now they're making everybody uh, take off their shoes, and so then what they did is, you know, so that it takes time, right? So then uh, what they, they're doing, every time they want to make the people take off their shoes, they want union representation. So then they get paid longer on the clock, you know, while we're going through this procedure, and then they're filing grievances on everyone. Another thing they're doing at Catch, they're expanding the, the search, they're making... The ladies lift up their shirt to show their belt, belt line or whatever, make sure they're, and they were, you know, it's very disrespectful and they were offended by that, so I'll, I guess, I don't know if the stewards are on that over there, but I just heard about it my last trip over there, get out the Teamster voice. Um, but they treat them like criminals, I mean, it's like barbed wire around the buildings and you have to go through a guard shack, you know, and um, I was thinking, you know, they, they should put over the gates of UPS, our box might fry. You know, work makes you free. You know, the biggest lie you ever told. But, um, uh, well, another big lie I was told when I was a kid, you know, you work hard and you get something for your hard work. You know, that was another big lie I was told. You don't get nothing for your hard work. You just get more, well, it's worse than that. You get more hard work. That's what you get for your hard work. So, so what you get, the way you get more is through struggle, but organizing a better contract and enforcing the contract. That's how you get more. Okay. So uh, let me uh, move on. So America was founded on slavery. It was encoded to law. Encoded in a way that looks good on paper, but with no, untrue, no true intention of freedom. But I, I digress. Those amendments are just words on paper. What we need is action. Action, I say. John Brown was a man in action. From the Potawatomi Massacre to the raid on Harper's Ferry, he fought a principled fight against slavery that drew the line in the sand that needed to be drawn against slavery. John Brown's action made, made people have to come out on one side or the other for, uh, 
either for or against slavery. In one year, the United States was engaged in a civil war that would end one form of slavery in this country. It took the leadership and sacrifice of one man, John Brown, to be that spark. And it took over 600,000 deaths when the bell finally told on traditional slavery. But a whole new form of slavery is waiting in the wings in the North. With the, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, wage slavery became the new spin on slavery. In some ways, it was worse than traditional slavery because they were not property. The bosses paid so little that the term starvation wages were born. People actually went, went hungry working full time because the bosses didn't care if they starved because there was another worker just waiting in line to take their place. And they had to beg to be allowed to sweep up the flour off the floor of the rail cars to feed their families. They were getting paid so little. You know, there were struggles in different industries against this form of slavery. Rail, steel, mining, manufacturing, to name a few, but I'm partial. I'm TV, you motherfucker. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the Teamster General Strike led by leftists in Minneapolis. The Teamsters struck the company, sent, and the company sent in thugs. And they beat them out of shape. They had to get the yellow tape. The Teamsters, you know, fought back. They fought back and won. They, the company sent in the police. And they, got, they beat the police out of shape, too. So then the company sent bigger and uglier thugs, but they were no match. The defense guard, the defense guard prevailed. They had trained and prepared for their mutual self-defense. They organized. What is this, this defense guard? Well, this, the defense guard was uh, a fighting workers organization that trained four of these eventualities. There were basically a lot of World War, World War I veterans in there at the time. And they practiced their marching in the streets. Uh, they practiced, you know, uh, shooting pistols and rifles. They prepared, you know, and they also, you know, they, they fought the people, they fought the, the company, company sucks, company thugs, the police in the streets for their jobs. And that's the kind of organization that we need to uh, build in this country, a fighting organization. But I'll, I'll get back to that. But uh, after that victory, though, everybody wanted, wanted to be a teamster. They organized more members. They got regional agreements. They eventually signed the National Master of Freight Agreement in Chicago in 1964, after 30 years of struggle. My retired brother, Teamster brother, John Cass, was at the signing. So uh, it's action, action, and more action that gets results. Per you know, basically perseverance, determination, and action. Okay, there's another example of where it takes struggle in a fight to get what you know, get results. It took a world war to stop the Nazis. It needed to be done, but that didn't stop, that didn't stop fascism. It persisted in Spain. So one must understand the, the true nature of America. America wasn't against fascism per se. There, were, there was other fascist countries, you know, imperialist countries, Japan, uh, Nazi Germany, imposing on the imperialism of the United States, you know, and their expansion and their colonies and so on and forth. But, of course, the Nazis were the wor worser of two evils, the Japanese were the worser of two evils, they needed to be fought, but they didn't fight them based on ideological principles. The ideological principles, you know, they use ideological principles, dividing conquer. they use all these different reasons to get, get them to fight the war for the bosses. But, and, uh, you know, and during that time in Spain, before World War II, you know, there was a fight against the fascists there. You know, and they made this so-called agreement, you know, that nobody else sent troops. Well, uh, Italy and uh, Germany backed the fascists in Spain, but, you know, the, you know, the United States and the rest of the people didn't back, back uh, you know, the anarchists, and uh, that's how that turned out. You know, they, they lost, but, you know, it didn't stop the Nazis from backing them. Okay, so um, now we can go out through history, and I'm going to go a little bit more, a little bit more through history of uh, examples of uh, where it takes action to get results. You know, non-violent civil disobedience was well and good. You use a bunch of different tactics for a bunch of different times, but it's action that's, that gets the results. Okay, another example of action, or a defense card, if you will, being effective, is when the KKK attacked our, Dr. Albert E. Perry, a vice president of the NAACP. After he was threatened, the NAACP had an armed group stationed at the doctor's house. When the KKK attacked, they were driven off in a gun battle. Then they decided to move their operation somewhere else. Okay. So then the KKK went on 
on the same organ, the same local group. He went on to de denounce the morals of Indian women at a rally. You know, the sheriff warned him not to do that. You don't want to come there talking this kind of trash here. But they didn't want to listen. So they were met by 500 armed, uh, well, 500 Lumbee Indians armed with clubs and guns. So basically they shot, shot out the lights and uh, it was on and the KKK fled, leaving all the regalia behind. The leader Cole fled in the swamp, leaving his wife behind. You know, that broke that uh, local chapter of the clan. That's what's understood, sheer power. Organizations that come in, whether they're racist, fascist, slave owners, whatever, you know, what they understand is sheer un unadulterated power. And when, when they're defeated in battle, and then they look weak, they lose su the support of the general masses, you know, the people, you know, the support of, you know, the, you know, the people, the people go either way. The people that are going you know, to go along with the crowd, they lose all that support. Now, these are all historical moments, you might say. You might say I read, read them about it on, in a book or online. But it's we, it's we who make history. I've been in some struggles. The neo-Nazis were rallying on the south side of Chicago. They were met in the fields and the streets with bottles and chains. They were charged on both sides. You know, the Nazis ran back to their cars, you know, beaten bloody, you know. Their cars got kicked, their windows got bust out, and they pulled away. After that, they weren't organizing no more in that neighborhood on the south side of Blue Island. And it was effective. It wouldn't have worked, it wouldn't have worked if we came down there with a couple of chants, you know, and, and, you know, and some nonviolence. That's what they understood. They understand, understood getting their head busted. I walked, on another incident, I walked the line in 97, the UPS strike. It was like when Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston, we shocked the world in 97. You know, we had the kind of leadership that mobilized the membership in uh, 97. I mean, we had, we, uh, we showed solidarity. We had buttons and sticker days, t-shirt days, parking lot rallies showing our solidarity. And then we could use a multi-tactics multi, multi to win, win the bat. The face of UPS to the customers is the drivers. So the drivers you know, reached out. Most of the drivers have a good relationship with most of their customers. And they reached out to them and let them know about our negotiations that are going on. They let them know that, you know, we might be going on strike soon. They said, oh, here, here's a sign. Can you put it, put it in your window if we go out saying that you're not accepting UPS packages? So, and then Ryan Carey, the, the leader that kind of mobilized the membership, he got, he got out on, you know, on TV and getting out the message that this is a fight for part-time jobs Part-time America won't work for it was a, a fight for a jobs for across America. So we won the messaging, you know. We won the messaging for the general public. We won the messaging to the customers. Uh, we showed the the uh, company that we had solidarity. And then when there was militant tactics that needed to be done, you know, militant militant tactics were also done when it was necessary. Uh, so I mean. What, what gets the good? You know, diversity of tactics, but militant tactics when necessary. The more action, the more we get. You know, so if we, if we had more militant tactics and we demanded more, it's, just, it's a matter of power. That's what it is. It's a matter of power. That being said, we have a contract coming up August 1st, 2013. We don't have the same kind of leadership in place. We are mobilizing a rank and file movement for a better contract. We have to put on similar pressure on the international leadership for a better contract. If you, so if you want to get involved in this struggle or the defense guard, see me uh, after the presentation. I'm all working with Occupy Chicago. We've got the Chicago Teachers Union struggles going on. Uh, there's going to be t-shirts out saying, I stand with the Chicago teachers. And then on one side, the other side saying, fighting something to the effect, you know, uh, giving the children those schools they deserve. You know, the ATU is having their contract negotiations. The, uh, the, uh, the taxi cab drivers are having a general strike. You know, and I believe everything is done for self-interest. But there's two ways to get what you want. Being begging on your knees and hoping to get a few scraps from the table, or standing together with your brothers and sisters that have the same interest in you and demanding, demanding that, that and you uh, a show of power. So we got all these struggles coming up. So. I'm in these struggles to help other unions because in, in other people in their struggles in the hope you know, to build solidarity and we get help in our struggles. An injury to one is an injury at all. And also, 
I'm going to run into Fiskar for anybody who's interested, who is a, a trade unionist, a communist, socialist, anarchist, a community activist, people along those lines you know, who want to learn martial arts. I'm a three-time Golden Glove yeah. champion, two-time U.S. kickboxing champion and amateurs, uh, Midwest Point karate champion, uh, seasoned street fighter. I've been in a few of those. <laughs> and, uh, so get the, the physical training so prepare ourselves for, for our own mutual self-defense. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, so anyhow, uh, just to add to that is I believe in you know more action the better, but I also believe in a diversity of tactics. And so I'm also running for president of the United States. So I'm making my announcement right here to be on be speaking at the, at the election debate at the, at the next meeting. You know and. I don't expect to win this first time. I didn't, I didn't win my election as steward the first time I ran for steward, but I learned from my experience and I won the next time. So this first time is going to be to get my labor message out. And I can give you a little bit of that. You know, first of all, we need to repeal Taft Hartley, pass the Employee Free Choice Act, make yeah, just yeah. cause law, so on and so forth. You know, a lot of things. Those are a few, a few of the things off the top of my head. But those knuckleheads. Oh, I guess I ain't supposed to say that last. I'm calling herself a labor party. They're all liars. They're a LaRouche pack people. They weren't a labor party. We need a true labor party. Uh, and the Democrats good. aren't the labor party. The labor party in England, they call themselves a labor party, but they're not a labor party. We need rank and file people that have a labor agenda. They're going to fight for labor, you know, and not, not have a, just like you, not, you know, a president company excluded. But la labor bureaucrats that actually work for the Democrats when the Democrats should be working for us. So, uh, I guess that's about it for today. Uh, thank you for your time. There are questions. I'm just giving me a second. Questions. I got water. Questions, Water, right? you have questions. Right. Okay, Bob Matter. Bob Matter over there. Andrew, uh, since Indiana became a free state, Louder. Oh. Right to work state. Uh, have, have uh, any UPS workers declined to uh, pay uh, union dues? Right to work state. Let me uh, rephrase that. The right to work for peanuts. That's what they mean by that. The right to be a slave. The right for the bosses to exploit the workers. Now, um, I'm going to be making a trip out to Indiana U UPS uh, next week. So if uh, any of them uh, have made that choice, you know, they'll, they'll be uh, free to let me know, you know. But the thing is, is the whole system, that, that, the whole setup is to undermine unions. So, so they cannot collect dues through, a pro, through the check the process, so they would have to hand collect dues. So it causes a lot of time and effort for the union. To spend, instead of spending time representing the members and doing what they're supposed to do, they're spending their time trying to collect the dues. And for example, a part-time worker is making 8.58 at UPS might not want to pay dues because they might not see the benefit of the union. They, they might not understand the benefits of you know pensions and health care and all that kind of stuff that comes in just cause. So there are going to be those people that do that. And then the purpose of it is to undermine unions and uh, the cripple them financially. Can you give us your views on where you think capitalism may be a good thing? <laughs> Uh, I can't think of any. <laughs> <laughs> Not even one. <laughs> All right, the boy in back. Actually, World Social Forum leaders very much agree with you that without an international uh, labor, your... World Social Forum leaders are agreeing with you without an international labor party, we're going to run into trouble. Right now, Walmart has half our food supply. Anybody uh, right. And so the question right. is, the question is, do you think people under the age of 30 listen to this message? I personally do, but what's your input on this? I think the uh, people under 30, 
uh, would be, I actually, what I hear is that they have been more receptive. Yeah. It's the older generation that still supports capitalism, and uh, the people under 30 are, I'm not saying uh, more for socialism, but it's kind of more even their opinions of, you know, capitalism versus socialism. I mean, people are indoctrinated from their childhood. I, I wasn't born, I wasn't born a leftist. You know, I didn't understand why we weren't, so, you know, when I was a kid, 1976, it was the 200th anniversary, you know, of this country, and, you know, I was ready, you know, to celebrate, I, you know, I was a little kid, I like party, I like fireworks, I like all that stuff, wave the flag. I didn't really know too much about the Vietnam War when I was seven, you know, I just knew it, it interrupted my cartoons on Saturday morning, you know. <laughs> you know it didn't, I wasn't really... You know, when you're seven years old, nobody tells you about that. But I was called Mayor Daly, though, when I was on vacation in Florida. You know, when I, I was walking around a restaurant like this, talking to people, I didn't know who Mayor Daly was, you know, when I was seven, five, six, seven years old. I was just talking, walking from place to place, talking to people. But yeah, I think the, the kids these days are apathetic because they don't believe that what they can do can change. But they, they, if, if we can show power and show that we can make changes, I think they'd be very receptive to the message. Yes, Dave Zuckert. What constitutes militant tactics? Repeat your question. Uh, what constitutes militant tactics? There's all kinds of militant tactics. Like, for example, like uh, if uh, and I'm going to mention solidarity along with militant tactics. For example, if uh, some uh, some uh, uh, vehicle delivery company is delivering some packages in an you know, uh, underground parking lot. And then the, uh, the IBEW might shut off the cameras for maintenance. And, and then the pump uh, tires in these package car vehicles get punctured. Their radiators get punctured. That might be considered a militant tactic. Or uh, if they're in these parking garages and then the exits are blocked with a bunch of stalled vehicles and they can't, they can't leave the uh, parking garages because there's these stalled vehicles blocking the path. That might be considered a militant tactic. What about sabotage? That might be considered a militant tactic. <laughs> Slow down, more stoppages, throwing a monkey wrench or something. Those might be considered mil militant tactics. Um, and in Europe, they kidnap the bosses. They kind of like go into office and hold them there until, you know, I mean, what happened in Republic Windows? It was a militant tactic. I was there on day two bringing them coffee and donuts. I was in that occupied factory in 2008 when, when uh, they actually refused to leave and occupied the factory, and they won. They fought back and they won. Yes, Walter. Is it a good uh, military tactic uh, to obey all of the company's rules and tie it into knots? Usually there are so many rules that they uh, they have to avoid their own rules. Right, they right. Uh, Isn't they, that a, an effectual way? Well, they wouldn't know with me because I work to rule every day. It's called a tactic called work to rule. I listen to the rules and do it. Everybody else doesn't. If everybody worked together, worked to rules, worked to rule, follow their rules, they would have an unintentional effect. And I say unintentional effect to slow down production. Carl? Uh, what percentage Sid. of the workers that you work with are in your union are, uh, do you consider class conscious? Uh, me? No, but, uh, but uh, I mean, we, we got people at work, it, it is, it's a broad spectrum. You know, even, I'd say, I, I can't give a number, but the percentage is low. I mean, even when, and even when they are class conscious, they tend tend to be apathetic, you know, and it's, and, it, and honestly, people of color tend to be more class conscious than the, than the white people in the union, you know, and it's sad to say that, but I mean, from, from their, not just from their work experience, but from being, being oppressed outside of work also, they, they're a little more hip to how unjust this American system is, you know, and and what we have here is a false class consciousness. Thanks, you made me think of that. We have a false class consciousness in this society. Obama keeps on talking about middle class, middle class, middle class. You know, and he wants people 
like me to think he's talking about me. He's not talking about me. He's talking about people making 200000 a year. He's talking about middle management. He's talking about doctors and lawyers. He's talking about small business owners. He's not talking about making somebody making 50 something thousand. But they want people to believe in this false class consciousness. We're working class. Even if you're making $100,000 a feeder driver making good pay, it's not based on how much money you make. It's based on how you make your money. It's through physical manual labor, then you're working class. So, on that tip, a professional athlete is still working class, even if he's making a million dollars, if he's still making his money from his physical manual labor. As soon as he gets an uh, endorsement from Nike, he's making more of his money from Nike than he's making from his physical labor, then he, he, he's not a member of the working class. If, uh, so we have a small, small, I don't got a percentage, but a small percentage of class consciousness and the people who are class conscious are tend to be apathetic. What about a salesman? Is the salesman working class? Or is he working? Well, I would say he's working class because there's probably somebody supervising or managing all the salesmen. I mean, but is his job selling the stuff or is he supervising the stuff? Supervisors or yeah. uh, workers? No, that, that, I, that's, that's a clear class line. They're not doing the physical manual labor. They're supervising other workers. No, that, that's not working class. And even if you're a part-time supervisor, I make more than the part-time supervisor, I'm full-time in UPS, but they're, they're not working class. It, it, it's divided on how you make your money and most of your work. Now, for example, they ruled against... And you're not working class? No, if you're a supervisor, even if you're a part-time supervisor, you're not working class. Now, they ruled against head... Right. And uh, they ruled against head nurses being in a union. They do most of their work, most of their day being a nurse, and only a small percentage of their time is supervising other nurses. So it's, it's based on what do you do the majority of your work doing. And I feel that was a bad decision. And these courts are taking over. Uh, I can't remember the name of it because it was a while back. But it's based on what the majority of what you do your work as and what get most of your money income from. Yes, uh, Bernie Connie. How would you go about organizing people that work but are not employed in the formal sense of employment, such as independent contractors? You know, you start organizing and act like a union from the get-go. You know, just, you know, act like you are a union. Act in solidarity or act how a union is supposed to be. And, I mean, I'm a teamster, but I like the concept of the IWW, one big union. And, and they're willing to organize everybody. They believe in industrial unionism in one industry or all workers. I just would like it, it could be called the teamsters. But, but when you start organizing and you act in solidarity in direct action, you know, and direct action gets the goods. You know, working together in unity. I mean, I'll give you an example. We got something called a grievance procedure at UPS. That can take two, three years, you know, if, uh, if we can't resolve it. Uh, I'll give you an example of direct action. We didn't get a better contract. We didn't, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, in capitalism. But what management did is shut off the radio on us that people wanted to listen to. Now, I wasn't even a steward at the time, but somebody was prepared to, to begin some action. And somebody started singing, we shall overcome. And everybody started singing. The management started telling us to shut up. You know, and, and the steward at the time hollered back up there. We have the right to free speech. We, now, we didn't stop working. We kept working the whole time because then they could have said, you know, slow down, work stoppage. But we kept on working and we were singing, we shall overcome. And guess what they did? It was the most out of tune, off key, most beautiful music I ever heard, but they turned that radio back on. Direct action gets the goods. And that's what you guys need to do. Start acting like a union from the get go. Charlie Paydock yeah. is probably not a worker because he is a not selling <laughs> not a federal employee. Yeah. Yeah. By definition, not a worker. He's not lifting, he's not, well, what, 
What? I, I don't know what it is. You're your burger. It might be middle class. Just joking. <laughs> what is it? The uh, employee, federal employees. I'm confused. Is there a question? Just biography. Just biography of some individual. There's a question time, right? He's got a question. Yes. Oh, my. my your, your question, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, don't you feel that the bosses and the CEOs? Have attributes that your labor agitators are lacking? <laughs> well, I would, well, I would say they're, they're, uh, they got attributes that uh, the labor movement don't, don't have. They're better organized than us. We, we pride ourselves in our organizing, but the 1% are better organized and they use divide and conquer tactics. And we should be using the same, we should be get better organized and use the tactics and fight fire with fire. You know, I mean, you know, and uh, the thing is, you know, they're even, they're lazy. That's what they are. The CEOs are lazy. The rich people are lazy. But they put a lot of time and effort into, you know, making that maybe initial sacrifice if they weren't born rich. But put a lot of initial effort. I won't call it work, but they put a lot of initial effort into doing what they got to do to get into a certain position so they won't have to work another day in their life. Well, people become Jews. Yes. Okay. Do you think it's useful to, uh, or even fair to, to, to classify, uh, I mean, to define, I mean, a new definition of what's working class and what is not? Um, the way you did it, rather than refer to what Occupy, I thought very smartly, did like the 98% or even the 90% uh, according to income, because I thought that your topic is exploitation. And exploitation takes place today on all levels, doctors as well. You know, it's not a matter of education. It's a matter of system. So do you think it's, it's so useful to, to, to have those uh, strict definitions and uh, level yourself like that? Okay, uh, well, I'll try to answer it. I hope I understand your question. Now, um, and it, it's going to be a kind of I cover a couple things because the way I look at it, you, you're asking a couple different things. Now, what I was addressing is this false sense of class consciousness in America. You know, they talk about you know they don't they don't mention working class too much, and they talk about this middle class. And in America, there's a lot of contradictions. Okay, with with, um, with union jobs you know, from the from basically the 40s to the 70s. You know, through struggle, we got, you know, the, the strongest unions got union workers in physical manual labor in this economic, got them in this thing called the economic middle class. Basically, they were, they, they made enough money to be in the, basically in this same category as far as financially. But this middle class is more of an American construct. And you know they got you know, they don't even like using working. They got lower, middle, and upper, and that and by having unions in, in from the 40s to the 70s, they kind of created this middle class that were actually they're working class. They do physical manual labor, but they got in this economic category called the middle class. Now from the 70s to now, the economics have changed. You know. They're in the same jobs. They, you know, they think they're in this middle class, which they're not anymore, because from the 40s to the 70s, as as productivity increased, wages increased for productivity. So therefore, we were able to buy goods and services we produced from the 70s on. And there's a lot of reasons that happened. You know, getting off the gold standard with Nixon, opening up China, the, the decrease in union density, you know, but I think the biggest thing is our wages did not keep up with productivity. So to have this so-called middle class lifestyle and be working class, how did we do it? 
Well, it's, instead of one, one uh, parent working, both parents had to work. When that wasn't enough, they maxed out their credit cards. When that wasn't enough, they took out the equity of the home to try to maintain this so-called middle class lifestyle, which basically is uh, unsustainable because our wages have not been uh, keeping up with productivity. The money's there, but it's been been been, been stolen. It's basically what is what is the word they like to use? Redistrib redistribution of wealth. It's been redistribution of wealth, but it's been going up to one percent for the last forty years. So, so I mean that. And so, is that they created a false sense of class consciousness in this in this country, with the, based on economics, not based on labor because the la labor that you do it's a big difference even if if uh, a feeder driver uh, works to, you know makes the same amount of money you know if you're driving a truck all day and, you know and you know with all the, you know the stress that comes with all that or and it's not the same kind of work at the end of the day if you were a doctor or a lawyer it's not the same physical taxing Tear, wear and tear on your body, but it's they created this false sense of class, class consciousness when they're talking about this middle class. And now I did it in my own, you know, I, I said it in my own words, but this is the scientific definition, you know, for proletariat. I use the word, word working class, but that's like a Marxist scientific definition, you know, in my, in my words of what working class is. They use the term. Petty bourgeoisie and bourgeoisie instead of middle class and upper class, but it's the definition of class is based on um, on the work you do as opposed to the amount of money you make. But I mean, you know, I can concede that you know professional athletes aren't as exploited as as much as as exploited as as much as uh, you know. You know, somebody working at, at UPS for 8.50 an hour. Because, man, they athletes. You know, I mean, the, the speed up in production at UPS, you know, it used to take an hour for them to un unload a semi-truck. Well, they got rid of the rollers and put these extenders in there, and it's 45 minutes. And they got all the young guys unloading, so they keep, you know, the speed up production on the, the, on the beginning end, you know, and then all the old guys are struggling to keep up, you know. And it's like, I've run marathons before. Like I said, I did all this stuff. But man, I'm struggling to keep up, you know. And I'm, in the, and I'm one of the younger guys in the sword aisle. You know, the, all the younger guys are unloaded in their 20s. And all the people and all the people in the sword aisle are 40s and 50s. So they, they put the young guys on the unload to start the production. To exploit, and I think I might get off a little bit on a tangent, but it's based on... You and Charlie, you're both men. Uh, take some more questions. Yes. I have a question. I agree with a lot of what you're saying as far as um, the middle class getting a beating, but isn't the pro part of the problem at least that a lot of the strength of the unions was in manufacturing, which has left, and now you're going to have to organize um, a service industry like Walmart and McDonald's and Lincoln Restaurant. How do you do that? Okay. Now, we, like I was saying, we lost union density. Now, those struggles. And I, you know, I talked about the struggle in 1934, the Teamster Rebellion, the general strike in Minneapolis. But I'll mention the auto workers as an example. The auto workers. Now, these factory jobs were low-wage, throwaway jobs back in the day. They weren't paying jack. They were paying the same as the McDonald's in relative terms back then. Okay? And, and uh, the AFL didn't really want to organize them. You know, they looked down on them, so on and so forth. But, you know, the CIO organized the factory workers and turned the factory jobs into good paying jobs. Who's the, t you know, who was the top of the line before this attack on the auto workers? And I'm going I'm to touch briefly on that. But the auto workers were, became top scale workers. Not because, you know, now people have just take, was taking it for granted the auto workers get paid so much, so on and so forth. And those people, you know, deserve that. So they didn't get it be, be, because, you know, certain jobs should pay more than others. They got it, or all the hard work they do. They, they had a struggle. They fought. They fought, and they occupied their buildings back in the 30s. And, they, and you know what they want for that struggle? All they want was union recognition with their first struggle. So the service workers today, I mean, manufacturing base, 
the, the right wing and all the people that outsource and the left and the Democrats will outsource the jobs to other countries. And I'm not big on this whole thing America, but I mean those people who who are patriotic, you know, they say they're patriotic are just full of crap because the country's strength is based on being able to have a manufacturing base. Now, but on the other tip, what's important to me is organizing workers. And just like we were, the, the auto workers were uh, organized in the 30s, we can organize the service industries, and they can be hot. Those can be 30-hour dollar jobs at McDonald's too. You know, just because people don't think of it, that it should be. Yes, it can. But we got, you know, there's people out there that think that's all they deserve. People got to, uh, we got to get, you know, build class consciousness to people. You know, you got to, you know, a lot in, it's not that people don't, you know, some people think, you know, it's just the way it is, so they accept it for the way it is, and they're apathetic that there won't be no change, but those jobs, McDonald's is making a killing. They can pay $30 an hour. Thank you, Emilio, for a good question. Yes. Yeah. Now, you say how the workers are being screwed now. When the fact is, the worker's been screwed from the from the beginning of humanity. This is nothing new. You might have had some blips where, of the, let's say, post-war years when they were doing good. But on the world scale, that's been really short blips. But this is part of what the world has always been. Well, well it hasn't always been this way. But uh, from the, and I'm going to touch on that, from the 40s to the 70s, that was your blip that you were talking about, the blip from the 40s to the 70s, this country was moving in the right direction on a lot of issues, slowly but surely, and a big part of it was union density, you know, for better wages and benefits. And, and some of the unions had to be dragged along screaming, too, to get into modern times, you know, on, you know, on social issues. But um, what you were talking about, it has been always been this way. Well, it, has, it hasn't always been this way, but it's always been this way since the beginning of civilization. We have a prehistory of um, hunter-gatherer society, which was a more egalitarian, you know, more equal society. It was, it was, it was probably based, it was based more on people's ability, natural leadership ability and ability, and everybody worked together as a commune to help each other out for the, the group for the, so for the group to survive. So it began, but the, see the thing is, it, it, uh, with civilization it became an agrarian society, there could be stored wealth. The problem began with stored wealth. And when it became a civilization, an agrarian society, they could store the grain or whatever, and then these people who were, who were thugs, you know, called themselves kings, pharaohs, emperors, they you know, even said they were gods or sons of gods, so whatever scam, scheme, whatever, they can get the people to worship them and get everybody working for them so they can get all the wealth. So, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't be civilized, but civilization is far more brutal than hunter-gatherer societies. You know, I mean, what the um, Romans did, you know, nail people to, you know, crosses, you know, when they had a slave revolt, you know, down, down you know, the main way, you know, the road to Rome was more brutal than anything, you know, you know, barbarians that are uncivilized people, but it was based on the advent of civilization. But it hasn't always been this way. It doesn't have to be this way. And I mean, capitalism is, is, is going to be collapsing one way or another. And, um, and just like in this country, uh, things are happening. And things can e either go one way or the other. Same thing in, that, in Germany. When everything was going, they had two movements going on. There was a kind of social leftist movement and a fascist movement going on. And it could have went either way. But uh, it was is basically the people in power, the social democrats, you know, sold out the left wing of the party and sided with the centrist. And what happened? The Nazis ended up taking over. And it was under, St under Stalin, he didn't support, you know, he supported one state. Uh, you know, communism or whatever, if there could be such a thing, you know, it didn't support, didn't, didn't support the left in Germany, it didn't support the left in Spain, so on and so forth. So, it's, 
things that, you know, uh, capitalism in crisis, and, and there's going to be a different way, but just like in the Soviet Union, when, it, when Stalin came in power, bad people take control of things, and good people do nothing. So, it doesn't have to be this way, but it, we need to organize, we need to organize so it won't be this way. Yes, uh, lady in the corner. No, I'm a member of the Chicago Teachers Union. And I'm not a teacher, so I'm not one of the higher paid members of the union. And I have heard it since we started our negotiations, how I'm one of the horrible people that wants 25% a 25 pay increase because I'm going to be working longer period of 25% increase day and I actually want to get paid for it. And I should lose my pension even though I've been paying in, into it. We're dealing with a perception of people all over the country with unions. We've seen it in Wisconsin, the public employees, that they want to take away things that we've been paying into. My answer has always been, well, if you don't have these privileges and these rights as a worker, you need to build your own union. How are we, as workers, going to fight this perception? Well, I, and I'm, uh, I'm on uh, the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Union. I'm not uh, the, the Solidarity Committee that they came up with with Occupy Labor. Um, I am not a member of CORE, but I mean, I know people in CORE and everything like that. And from, from my understanding is you're only going to, they're only allowing you to negotiate over the wages and benefits and stopping you from negotiating over a lot of other stuff and actually stopping you guys from, get, you know, talking about certain things to the general public. For, for example, they're only letting you talk about the wages and you know, whatever else else getting cut, you know, it's you know, the, the makes it difficult to win sympathy for people. But you know, what you're going to be doing is working longer hours, so you should have an increase in that. But Occupy and other unions can get out the message that you guys want to get out. You know, that you're not allowed to get out. You're not allowed to do. You, your, your, your union has the ability to do certain things, but. Other organizations have the ability to do other things that you can't do, and so on and so forth. So working together in solidarity with other organizations, uh, I feel is a good way to get the message out. Now, I mean, I heard, you know, I heard that there's, you know, the, the ROM is putting out, you know, the spin machine, but I don't listen to those radio stations anyhow. So, I, but I mean, I listen to progressive radio, and I hear, you know, uh, the ads from. Uh, the Chicago Teacher Union and stuff like that. So I mean, it's it's going to be a lot of hard work. It was like basically, guys, Chicago Teachers Union been working for a couple of years on these struggles. And what I see is uh, what needs to be done. Is what's going on is flyering different events in the city of Chicago, getting the word out about the struggle for the teachers unions. And then another thing that they have is teach-ins, teach-ins in the community. You know. Uh, educating, you know, building solidarity with the parents because part of the thing is who's the customers at UPS? You know, uh, you know the people we deliver the packages to, and uh, they have good relationships with the package car drivers for the most part. So the the customers were the teachers, but actually I guess would be the parents of the children, the children and the parents. So to build that build that solidarity. And, and having in, in, in the communities, and you guys can, I would say, is have things called parent teacher conferences sponsored by the teachers, you know, at, at places, they have meetings, and talk about the issues and struggles, and then be prepared if you guys go out on strike, you know, to provide you know, maybe te teachings for the children, where you know, you know, you meet up in the kids and all that, the parents, and then you guys maybe go to the park and then you have a teaching and stuff like that. I mean, to build solidarity, solidarity among your union, but that's not enough in these times, you know, especially in the public sector when they try to frame the images, you guys are the bad guys. You need to win the hearts and minds of the, your customers and the general public, you know, 
And uh, after they had those big rallies, you know, you know, the, the nurses and the teachers, they knocked Brown back on his heels, organizing, bringing the many, most people to bear as you can possibly on it. Jane, does my, that answer your question? No, it, it didn't. My question well, was, let me how can we, as, as union members and, and, and those in labor, counteract the, the general anti-union feeling in this country? We're back to where we were when my, my grandfather was getting his head beaten in for 10 cents an hour with the United, founding the United Carpenters Working, Workers Union. We are back on our heels with the way things you don't have gone think in Wisconsin. Teachings are going to do it? Please? Teachings. Said no, teachings aren't going to do it. Well, that, that was a particular situation with the, the teachers' union in a particular struggle. But uh, I think, well, from the Teams to Rebellion, when, when they fought back in the general strike and won, if you fight back and beat your employer, that, that's what I believe that's what's going to galvanize people who want to be in a union. I think that's what's going to win. They, you, when you fight back and win, if you're constantly losing, people get fired and you lose, and you get knocked down and you lose, who wants to, who wants to be a part of that? When, when a you know, team wins the World Series and the basketball, everybody joins on the bandwagon. So if you can win in struggles, that's how we can win. By organizing and organizing victories. We, what we need is, like in our union, the, like, the workers, you know, the new hires making 850 hours, they don't see no benefit being in a union. But if we can enforce the contract and win better contracts, we get them involved in the union. And then they're out organizing. And then we're telling, you know, when we're organizing people, we, you know, tell them our message and tell them our benefits of being in the union to organize more people in the union. And when we win organizing victories, and when we have victories, that's what's, what's going to galvanize people. Not by making concessions. Concessions to the bosses. Who wants to be in the union if you're always making concessions in your week? Okay. Well, uh, Two-part question, kind of. Uh, are other delivery companies like uh, uh, you know, FedEx and uh, DHL, are they also experiencing similar tactics <coughs> like management to the workers? Okay, that was the first part of the question. And then the second part of the is, I seem to remember UPS was picking up truck people drivers. from Gary and driving all the way over to the other side of the, the facility over there by 55 the UPS, and they, and they were having to work there, and then they were taking my bus and bring them all the way back. Are they still doing that? Uh, at, at the Hodgkin facility? Yeah. Uh, they, uh, employ a lot of people from uh, the inner inner cities, like in Chicago, I guess, from Gary, too, and the house camps. And, um, uh, you know, buses will come where the people come. So, I mean, uh, I guess they got they got bus services. They actually go to the Hodgkin facility. From Gary, I've seen that. Look, I didn't know it was from Gary, but I know they, they, they have bus routes. They go to the Hodgkin facility. The bus comes into the parking lot. And there's, they actually have two drop-offs, because the, the building's so big. You know, one gate's about a block away, and they drop on one gate or the other. But uh, what was the first part? Okay, the other like DHL and FedEx, and, uh, they, do they have similar labor issues with management? Uh, well, now DH, DHL is uh, represented by Teamsters. What happened at DH, we lo see our union, our local union lost membership. DHL used, you know, cut U.S. delivery. What they're doing mm -hmm. is they only deliver from the United States to other countries, or from other countries to the United States. They used to deliver from point to point, like they would deliver from Chicago to New York, or so on and so forth. So they cut that. So we lost a lot of membership. you know. And what they did is try to pull a fast one, didn't give the people the WARN Act for their layoffs. So then we took them to court, we beat them on that. And since then, we got some, some members put back on. But we lost membership because DHL, you know, Stop their internet. Stop their point-to-point, -point, you know, delivery within the United States. Now FedEx is a non-union company. Right. They organize a couple, couple facilities on the East Coast, but they're, um, I don't know what the outcome of, of that is. But they they were trying to, you know, stop that or get that taken away because, uh, you know, a couple couple reasons because they fall, but one of them is they fall under a different labor act. Really? Uh, Right, they find they fall under the Railway Labor Act as opposed to the National Labor Relations Act. The National Labor Relations Act, which UPS falls under, and 
And uh, FedEx does the same thing we do, but they fall under the Railway Act. But it's easier to organize under the National uh, Labor Relations Act that we can organize one facility at a time or, or everybody at once, however we want to do it. But under the Railway Act, it says you only, you only can organize organize the whole company or nobody at all. Another factor is, yeah. is the FedEx misclassification of workers, misclassifying them as independent contractors as opposed to workers. If you work for the boss, and you, there's certain criteria that determines whether you're an independent contractor or a worker. It's not what the, it's because the boss calls you one. But if, if they tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, blah, 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 you know, you're a worker. If you're an independent contractor, they just tell you you want this done, and you go about and do it, do it your, how you want to do it. Then you, you can be an independent contractor. That's the layman's version of it. But, uh, so, but the uh, FedEx misclassification. Also, uh, Fred Smith from uh, FedEx uh, threatening Congress with a, uh, threatening a government saying they're going to uh, pull orders for more airplanes if you know they don't if they if they change the labor laws and put them under. Now FedEx started off as an air delivery and UPS started as a ground delivery, but both of them, are, you know, UPS expanded in the air and FedEx expanded in the ground. So basically, we do the same job, same jobs, but we fall under different laws. But, Fred Smith is trying to say, and I'm not big on UPS, but Fred Smith is trying to say UPS gets special privilege. When it, actually that's a lie. It's, uh, it's FedEx that's getting a special privilege. Now, we had a day, you know, I mean, I called and did my thing, telling, you know, basically saying, you know, I called the Congress, Senate, whatever, when, and sent the emails out saying to put uh, FedEx under the National Labor Relations Act. Now, UPS, well, you know, way after I did it, I don't know, months and months later, what they did, they had a campaign, and they framed it a little bit differently. They said they they want to be the same labor act as FedEx. They didn't go and say they wanted wanted FedEx and the National Labor Relations Act. They just wanted to be fair, so they'd be willing to be put it get put in the in the Railway Act, so make it more difficult for us. <coughs> All right. I see you have another question. Ms. Last question, and it's from professional unions that have grown in, in St. Andamora, one of the hundred top labor leaders, is now saying we have to have strike hard, we have to be greater than 10% opposition research, and we have to use viral media, because we have 800 million people on Facebook alone. Do you agree with that? We have to fight hard, we have to use opposition research fast. Um, we work very fast at National Research United. Do you agree with that? Opposition, uh, opposition you, uh, research is we're on viral media and we move fast when people oppose. Have you come to a question, Ms. Yeah, she asked a question. 10%, do you believe we have to move more than 10% in opposition research as she asked for professional unions? And do you believe we have to use more viral media? From one of the 100 top labor leaders, that's the question. I mean, I don't know what the percentage number is, what we need. I, we need greater union density. The more union density, we have more power. Uh, I believe we need to reach the membership in any way possible. We're in a contract campaign at UPS. I send out the emails. I make the phone calls. But, I mean, nothing, uh, nothing will replace face-to-face -face meeting at the gates. But we, we need to use every form of media possible, you know, Twitter, whatever, Facebook. I've been kicked off of Facebook. I came back under a different name because, you know, that a lot of people are there. I'm on union, but it's 5,000 plus members, so there's not that union density. But we need to, we, we need to build union density. Uh, that's, that's the key, because the more union density, the more strength we have. Uh, we, we, need to use, we need to reach the people where they're at. So where are the people at? We're, we reach them, whether it's Facebook, whatever. And we need to be able to act faster than the companies and the, and the bureaucracies of the union. We need to be able, you know, to respond to stuff quickly and, and, even, and more so proactive. I kind of like what the, you know, the trades, uh, you know, the, the construction, they, 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 they pick in places, not even their companies, but, you know, if it's non-union being used, pro they take the fight proactively. We need to be, pro we need to really lead a, lead a proactive fight. Like in the contract campaign, we need to hit the ground running more than a year in advance on stuff. You know, we need to be proactive, use every form of media, reach the people where they're at, and I don't know what the percentage number, but I mean, I believe that 
oh, there should be 100% union density for working folk. There should be a law that you have to be in a union if you're a worker. If you have a boss, you, uh, you need a union. These anarchists keep saying there ought to be a law. No. All right. Uh, there is a law. It's, it's wonderful to follow. You know, like the, the, the FedEx letter kind of thing that you put, you know, uh, I know it costs like four ninety to mail that. Does UPS have something similar, and do you know how much it is? Oh, uh, they, they have kind of like a, this, this little small box, and you put it, anything you fit in there would be one price. I mean, I, I'm not at the customer counter to handle that, but they have, it sounds like they have something similar similar to that. It's like an envelope. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is familiar with it. I am. It's probably cheaper to use the postal service. Uh, what, four what, nine, okay, the 490 <laughs> thing you're talking <laughs> about is a priority mail flat rate box it's for the post office. The UPS, it's normally still something like 12 something dollars to send a package and a, a, one of the UPS prepaid envelopes overnight or second day air. Okay. Okay. How much are those? Usually about 12 to 13 dollars. So it's Okay. It's still cheaper to use the post office for priority mail. Bernie, what do you think of a uh, Democratic mayor, actually two of them now in a row that uh, they say they're Democrats, ostensibly in favor of labor uh, and union friendly. Uh, ostensibly, but uh, they're claiming no money, they're doing what they can to dilute the unions, but they have all kinds of money for uh, projects requiring TIF funds. Are you talking about Daly and Ron? Gee whiz, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they, 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 there's money out there. There's all kinds of money, but it's the rich folk that got it. The one percent they got it. I mean, I protested NATO. I thought they're protesting. They, the millions of dollars that they spent to host NATO, they were going to host the G8, but you know they lost that battle. We we forced them out. But they, they got all kinds of money to spend money when they want when they want to spend it. You know, you hear about this, that, or another, what they're going to spend money on. You know, they have the money, but what they want to do is they use all. They, what they want to do is break the unions. They're, they're attacking the teacher unions, and, and, it, and the, the whole world is watching, you know. You know I mean, what they said in 68, they were saying that at NATO. The, the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching the struggle with the teacher unions. And we got to, we got to, all the unions and the public got to throw their support behind the teachers, you know, because it's Democrats, you know. Democrat in name only, and I mean, I'm not big on Democrats, but when I think of Democrat, I think of FDR. Yeah. And he did what he did because he had pressure from below by socialists, communists, so on and so forth, unionists, put pressure on him because he was a rich guy and he was afraid of revolution. And, you know, there was organizations on the ground that made him do what he had to do. But it seems like these Democrats, we got, you know, we don't got the organization on the ground, but, you know, they, they seem a little bit harder to push. They move so far to the right. I mean... You know, it's like the, the Democrats, the mayors of Chicago, the Republic, Democrat in name only, they might as well be Republicans, you know. And, uh, the, and their privatization of public services is termed neoliberalism. I, I, like, I think the term is fascist when they privatize public services, and that's what it's about. Unions fought for, for uh, the, the children to be in school and they're not working their minds, and they're trying to take that away. Uh, it's, I mean, it started... With, you know, uh, with Obama and uh, his point man over here in Chicago, I forget his name off the top of my head, the charter schools, and they rolled that all across America. A small town in Rhode Island, a factory town that closed down. They fired the teachers, you know. They fired the teachers out there, and that should have been uh, the, well, the peck is, is Petco moment. But, you know, it's, it's the debate moves so far to the right, so the Democrats have been following them further and further to the right, to, you know, to prove that they they uh, they're willing to work with the Republicans. It's absolute nonsense. And you know, people prefer strong and wrong than right and weak. You know, so that's that's the problem with the Democrats. I mean, not but not that, the real problem is they really don't have our interests in mind, and they 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 do the interest of people giving the campaign money, not the people who vote for them. Walter Collins. Did you know that it was another great liberal Democrat that screwed the FedEx 
workers by getting the uh, federal laws arranged, and that's why uh, Mitchell of Maine. That's why he didn't run for re-election, because the people of Maine, including a lot of my relatives, would not vote for him again. <coughs> he was a, a, a liberal Democrat. Did you know that? George he, 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 he screwed, he screwed <coughs> up his labor just as much as anyone here in Chicago does, right? Clinton on NAFTA. I mean, he, he, I mean, he did, uh, Clinton, you know, didn't get involved in the UPS right when the UPS saw that injunction, so I give him that. His big thing was an inaction. But, right, they're both, the Democrats and Republicans are both bought for, bought and paid for by the 1%. You know, they, you know, and um, they do what the, the people give them the campaign donations want them to do, not the people who vote for them. Because what did Ron Emanuel say? Basically he said, basically he said, you know, after UAW, you know, when, when they gave the bailout to GM, and uh, it was on condition that the auto workers cut their pay in half with the new people coming in and no pensions and you know, only 401k plans. When GM at that time was building, spending a billion dollars to build a factory in China, they didn't need to bail out. It was just subterfuge to break the union. And it's the same thing with all these other things, subterfuge to break the union. Democrats in name only. We need a, a labor party in, in America. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're ready for uh, rebuttals, Brom. You think? I think it you may well be. Well be. Let's uh, thank our speaker. Uh, uh, we have a process here right. for those of you who are not familiar that already Frank is at the end of the uh, line of chairs. Very good, Joe. Okay. I would, re Ram, I would recommend about five minutes each per speaker for rebuttals. Let's raise the count the number of speakers before you pass out a minute. Count the number of speakers before you pass out a minute. Okay. Thank you. Rebuttals do not always have to be on something that the speaker said, but uh, <laughs> you will impart your knowledge, your questions, your uh, wisdom. Uh, uh, in the allotted time. Now, how much time do we have? How many speakers do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen. Twenty minutes each. Thirteen. I'm sure. An hour Fourteen. At least thirteen. Well, we have five minutes for at least for round one. No, no. So, I mean, there'll be more coming up, I'm sure. Four minutes. Up to five minutes, please. That's an hour. Beginning with. <laughs> Francisco Aguilar. Bye. Did we thank our speaker? Yes. Yeah, Very good, Joe. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, the way this system is, is running uh, is not sustainable. And the rating is accelerating. Uh, the rate at which we are uh, accumulating wealth in the upper and the way we will rape in the environment is accelerating um, for the workers as well as uh, the rape to all the satellites of the United States, like in Latin American and Central American countries where we have uh, the boot on these people's necks. Um, the rape of the earth resources is also accelerating. It's very obvious if you look at the statistics of how we're going into different areas to extract more and more minerals faster and faster. Uh, when Joao Goulart, uh, president of Brazil, was trying to uh, start building ship, ships by means of uh, exploiting the iron they have there, we send the troops and kill them. Uh, so if we don't know that, well, it's our, our fault. Uh, the reason that this is accelerating is because the era of plentiful energy is coming to an end. So the people who are in power 
or in control of the economy are in, in, in a more and more of a hurry to, to extract as much as they can, as fast as they can, because this is, this is coming to an end, and they know it. It, it's, it's, it's so obvious. Um, it's obvious to anybody. Of course, the propaganda is, oh, don't worry, everything is going fine. But you, you see their actions, and you can deduct of what, what is it. And then we'll extract the last drop of blood and the last drop of, of any resources of the earth uh, until they, they could maintain the system working. And then after that, they will use the guns and, and, and the force that they have uh, prepared for to, to keep the poor or the hungry and all that in check. And so then many people who today are supporting the system uh, are going to be hungry and so that will be too late for, for change. Um, until the people have a voice not only on what we should earn, but also in what we make and what are the consequences of what is made. Uh, I, I always uh, hear in the College of Complexes people know me as Plastic Shed Frank. <laughs> and uh, this is because many, many years ago, in 1970s, 70s, I used to go scuba diving, and I also carried this bag, and when I went down on the, on the corals and all that, I found pieces of shit, plastic <laughs> shit. And I put it in my bag trying to clean up. Well. Noah have determined that today, every day, 4,500 tons of plastics enter the sea every day. One billion tons of plastic shed enters the sea every day. Now, the plastic industry is fighting <coughs> to prevent the passing of laws so you cannot use plastic bags into your shopping centers. They are fighting that. Uh, plastic bags are only one little thing of the amount of plastic that is being produced and is discarded <coughs> into landfills, but through the rivers, through the waters, through, it's, it's going into the sea of the ship. Um, <coughs> poets and musicians were screwed of their earnings until they organize. And now you have the musicians' union, and they have to be paid for the music that they produce and how much is played. Engineers, designers, and other artists on the engineering field, they don't have protection. I am a sample of that. I have made designs and ideas that produce millions of dollars to the corporations that I work with. And what they did when the thing was working, they fired me, so I couldn't complain. Uh, so if you don't think when you work for somebody that you are not being fucked from the very same day that you start working, you are living in another world. You are ignorant of your own, you know. Immediately, and I am telling my son is an architect, he started working and he's so happy they are paying him big money and, and they are paying insurance and say they are fucking you, Thomas. Oh no, I mean they, they are they treating me very well. I said, Well, you didn't feel the, the prick yet, but you will eventually. It's, it's just as simple as that. You when you start working this system is, is taking the wealth that you're producing and take it totally away from you. And when you don't produce anymore, they kick you in the ass and that's it. Um, so when people mention that this is worse than the slavery that happened before, I, I tend to agree. This is, this is really brutal. This is really brutal. Um, so, we, you know, many people are robbed of their intellectual productivity on all the industries everywhere. Um, so I think that the lost, we lost this battle. I don't think we can we can regain it anymore. I think it's too late. The world is coming to a situation where we run out of not only the fuels that allow us to cultivate the way we're doing it with big corporations, with big tractors and all that. Um, <coughs> Millions of people who are both hungry. Uh, the, our 
what we call government, uh, this piece of shit that we have up there, they are passing laws to prevent the corporate, uh, the insurance companies to take in consideration the raising of the seas. <laughs> so you cannot even mention that it's a global warming producing uh, 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 sea level rise, and estimating the uh, losses that the corp that this insurance could 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 accrue because of the raising of the sea is forbidden to to do that to to ac accommodate for this coming event. So the developers, oh, that will stop the development of the coast because it will cost more to insure people from building. Well, it's illegal. Illegal. Now you can read South Carolina. It's just, it's just, it's just ridiculous, laughable. But they keep denying what is what is happening because they want to continue wrecking the earth as fast as can, as fast as it can be done. Develop more things, taking more money from the people. What if they are underwater later on? Fuck them. Who cares? We got their money first. Um, so I think we lost the battle. I think we, we are coming to a big, big, big disaster. Today the news told us that one million to two million people are without electricity for one to two weeks now. You know how much reserve energy a nuclear power plant has? 20 fucking four hours. Nobody's saying anything about the nuclear power plants. I didn't see in any of the news. But if a nuclear power plant doesn't have electricity for a week, where are they going to get the fuel to maintain those generators producing the, the electricity they need to pump the cooling water in the reactor? Now, so we are in the brink of disaster now. And it seems like everybody's with their eyes closed. It's a disaster coming, guys. And if it doesn't happen now, it will happen later. We are in the brink of a big disaster. Uh, in Fukushima, they are not telling us, but in the next 10 to 50 years, the, the, the Prime Minister of Japan said it will take 10 to 50 years to clean up the mess in there, but he's not telling you that in that time, there is something that they are not even talking about touching because it's so touch and go that it could be a nuclear disaster 50 to 100 times bigger than Chernobyl. What it is that one of the cooling pool, uh, pools where they have the fuel rust is teetering now, that they found that it's three centimeters in the, in the height of the pool, it has tilted three centimeters. And so the government hurrying up to put some reinforcement, but according to the geologists, in the next 10 years, it's a 90% chance, according to the geologists, that it will be an earthquake big enough to tilt this thing down, which it will be a disaster 100 times bigger than Fukushima. It will affect the whole world. It may have to evacuate many people from Japan, and so on and so on. So we are, we are in, the, in, the, in the deep of the biggest uh, calamity that society has ever encountered, and I don't see that we can stop it. Okay. Uh, you did a pretty good, pretty good job, Frank, finally coming around. Huh? I'll get back to your old self, but I... The, the part about what can we do, and Frank said, I don't think we can do too much. Well, I have to agree with Frank completely because human beings that I've been witnessing for umpteen number of years are like robots. And I understand why they've been conditioned to serve the master. And ain't nothing you can say intelligently that will have them to do what Socrates say, examine themselves, and look and see what's going on around them. I mean, the, 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 the problem is so clear, blind people can see it. We're talking about money, we're talking about cooperation. 
It's more money out there now than ever been in the history of the goddamn yeah. world. It's yeah. more money out there now than ever been in the history of the world. Well, where is it? It ain't buried in the sea. It's not in no hole in the ground. It's hidden in somebody's warehouse. Yeah. And the one who said will yeah. use it yeah. when it comes a time to use it. And yeah, you can they probably the use it in a way so they can further robotize the masses. Well, I got news for you. It ain't no liberals. Ain't no Republican. There's no Democrat. They feed that to you and they repeat it over and over on the radio in the newspaper, etc., etc. What is the, the way the guy in charge wanted to be? And the guy in charge don't care who the hell you are. The question for the guy in charge, the guys in charge, is what can you do for me? Don't give a fuck about what race you are. You stick it up your ass like would anybody else. <laughs> if you're too blind to see that, give me a break, please. Oh, Greece, over there, there are people middle class two or three years ago. What color are they? They stand in the motherfucking line eating soup. So why aren't, and by the way, the people with the money ain't all in the United States. They're all over the world because they're all together. And you're going to sit here and act like you can't see that, like the speaker said. This is supposed to be your bigger thing. And to me, the next thing is your ears. All you got to do is remember what was said yesterday. I can remember what was said 40 yesterday's ago. I can remember what was said 50 years ago. I saw what was happening as things went on. I mean, I don't need nobody to tell me that a revolution has been taking place in our country. I was here when it happened. And you think that I got to read the book to know that? No, because the revolution wasn't a classic type like in China. Even ours when we first had it here. Uh, the revolution in, in uh, France, uh, England back in 18 whatever it was. The evolution that they taught us in the book is a kind of classic type revolution where you start at the bottom and the people rise up. Well, our revolution started at the goddamn top. The people at the top taking our goddamn country and ain't fired a shot. Ain't fired a shot. Why? Because he don't need to. He discovered that the guy mentioned something about slavery. But I read the book and I saw a picture. They were bringing slaves over. They had chains all around their legs and shit. Well, the man said, shit, I need my chain. And the guy with the gun said, shit, I can have him doing something. So he taking the chain off his motherfucking leg and put it around his head. So he do that to everybody. Anybody he want to use get the same treatment. And if anybody standing around and oh, 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 not me, you is the biggest fool I ever seen in my goddamn life. Because the guy that wants to you, what does he want? He wants what he got. Power and money. Out of all the money in the world, I don't see, I've been coming around here for many years. I don't see nobody here saying, hey man, I'm rich now. I see the same poor ass before that's up. <laughs> I'm Michael Foley. First thing I want to say about first thing I want to say is about Joe. I've heard Joe speak before. I I agree with almost everything Joe says. And personally, I like Joe and I think well of Joe. One thing I want to say is, as far as all this stuff, political protests and disputes or labor disputes, labor protests, things like that, I believe all this stuff has to be legal, lawful. And Legal, lawful, and non-violent. That's just what I believe. I don't want to say anything more about that because I could talk about it for a long time. Anyway, I'm not trying to put words in Joe's mouth, but he says that the people, generally, generally speaking, Joe's saying the people on the lower rungs of the ladder in this country are getting screwed by the people on the higher rungs of the ladder. And that's the way the system is set up, and that's the way designed. That's what it's supposed to do. Screw the people on the bottom by the people on the top. I agree with what he's saying. 
If anybody disagrees with that, that's okay. You don't have to believe Joe. You don't have to believe me. Pay attention to other people. Warren Buffett says he pays less income tax than the secretary. as a percentage basis. But Warren Buffett says he pays less percentage of his income in tax than the secretary. A couple months ago, Barack Obama was talking about the same thing. It turned out the media reported President Barack Obama pays less income tax than his secretary on a percentage basis. <laughs> Another thing, I got to hear something more. Boy, yeah. Back in, I think it was early 2010, it was early in President Obama's, it was early in President Obama's presidency, but there was some kind of a bill was introduced into the Congress, introduced into the House and the Senate, it had something to do with the banks, and the banks were opposed to it. So the banks had their people push this bill through the Congress, it went through all the committees that was supposed to go before, it went through all the hearings they were supposed to have and everything, and it was brought to a vote, and this all took place in about a week, and this bill was overwhelmingly defeated. The banks made sure that bill went through Congress right away and quick, and got knocked down now. And after that, Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois, Shut it up. he's one of the highest powerful, most powerful people in the Senate. He went before the TV cameras, the TV cameras said, what happened? Senator Dick Durbin says, the banks own this place. He was talking about the United States Congress. The banks own this Congress. That was said by none other than Senator Dick Durbin. And he wasn't even complaining about it. <coughs> he wasn't saying, gee, we've got to do something here. We've got to change this. The banks run this show. He wasn't saying anything like that. He just flat out said, a matter of fact, the banks own this place. Now, earlier this year it was reported, last year General Electric made $5 billion in profit. That wasn't $5 billion in income, that was $5 billion in profit. And they paid zero income tax, zero federal income tax. Nobody said they were cheating on their taxes, they weren't cheating on their taxes. Somehow, the income tax set up, law is set up that a company can make $5 billion in profit and not have to pay federal income tax. When people start talking about capitalism, I don't know nothing about capitalism because it's never existed in this country. According to what people say about capitalism, if you don't make money, you go broke. If there was capitalism in this country, AIG insurance company would no longer exist, General Motors would no longer exist, Chrysler Corporation would no longer exist twice. They got bailed out twice. The ten biggest banks in this country got bailed out. If it was capitalism in this country, the 10 biggest banks in this country would have gone under in 2008-2009. We got welfare. I'm not talking about women living in high-rise buildings with four or five kids. I hear people complain about that all the time. There ain't any woman on welfare ever got a check for $175 billion from us. All right, I got one minute. The last thing is this. I was looking up something several years ago about Patrick Henry. One of our founding fathers, he's the guy that said, give me liberty or give me death. I found out that was only the first half of his statement. The second half, I gotta paraphrase the second half because I don't remember exactly, but he, he said, give me liberty or give me death because I don't want to be a slave, I don't want to have to live like a slave. But Patrick Henry owned slaves. He had no problem with owning slaves, but he didn't want to live like one because he knew what it was like. The other thing is the founding fathers, when they said that, Joe mentioned this, when they said that all men are created equal and all men have rights and all that bullshit, okay. they were lying. They meant all rich white men. All rich white men have rights. All rich white men are created equal. And the rest of them, forget it. Actually, we built this uh, country on slavery, basically. But Marx called primitive accumulation. That is, people work by their hands. They pick cotton, they pick tobacco, especially the cotton, went over to England. England manufactured it, sent it back to us as the finished goods. 
And also in the East, they've done the same thing and accumulated capital. That's where capital comes from. It only comes from people working for a living. And that's the way they started by primitive accumulation or slavery. Now, right now, people are talking about the economy and how bad it is. Well, about 0.5% control most of the wealth of the country. It's not even 1%. It's even tinier than that. And the only way they're able to accumulate that type of uh, wealth is by exploitation of labor. That's the only way they do it. If you read Marx, and you have to read Marx to understand this type of society, it's capitalism, he explains all that. And all societies die. I don't care what type of society it is. We had uh, uh, primitive societies that eventually passed away. We had uh, slavery under Rome. It lasted about 1,800 years. We had feudalism, and now we got capitalism. Capitalism is starting to die. It's top heavy. It's uh, like a it, like an upside down pyramid. All the wealth is on the bottom, and the masses are on the top, and it's going to tumble. It can't last too much longer. I think we're in a pre-revolutionary type of situation. If you look what's happening in Greece, in Spain, in uh, Ireland, in all these various countries, we could see people rising. The left is getting a very big vote. In uh, Greece, it's it got something like 18 or 20 percent is trying to f form a government there, and I think eventually it will. Capitalism is not going to last. It doesn't have too much longer because it exploited the whole world. Nobody got wealth enough to buy back the products, and it can't last. So what they're doing is extracting everything they can out of the people that are working to the point where they're going into starvation. And nobody's going to stand for that after a while. They depend on the army in order to uh, keep the, uh, this type of exploitation going. But if you look at revolutions, we find that the army is going to revolt eventually, like it did in uh, Russia, like it did in China. It, uh, it was the Tsarist army, and they formed the Soviets at that time, consuls, and the uh, workers formed Soviets or consuls, and eventually they overthrew the government there. Same thing happened in China. The, the uh, whole army almost all revolted. So it's going to happen here eventually, too. I don't think that uh, capitalism has much longer to live. It, uh, it's lasted something like 500 years, which is actually a very short period in history. And it's not something that uh, keeps going and going and going. All, all finite things have to die. And, and the type of society we have is dying now. You can see it all around you. If you watch television, the, the uh, culture in the country is dying. It's all full of violence and sex. And uh, people can't make a living. They can't buy back the uh, goods that are produced. And you have all kinds of uh, crimes here, all kinds of uh, poverty and everything else. <coughs> the, the, the whole thing is just thinking. And the people are become, uh, becoming conscious of it. There's been uh, surveys, and if, if in the United States, Noam Chomsky talks about the surveys, and he says that about 80% of the populace in the United States realize that all the wealth is on the top. And when all the wealth is on the top, people are going to become conscious of it eventually and get rid of this whole damn system. Right. You know, I, I agree with much of what Joe has said, but I think he's wrong when he says there was nothing in the revolution of 1776 for the ordinary person. we got to realize that by the Declaration of Independence, the colonies merely announced to a candid world, to use Jefferson's statement, the reason that they were compelled to separate from the jurisdiction of the King of England. 
Now that system was an exploitive system, the British imperial system, where they, as was I, our previous speaker pointed out, they took our raw materials, took it to England, and then returned it at a premium price. We escaped that system by the revolution. Now at that time, there was no changes in the fundamental law. The colonies claimed their status as states hereforth, and they were superior to their previous condition. That's what the revolution of 1776 was about. It had nothing to do with the, really the United States of America, which at that time, the Confederacy, was merely a mutual defense organization to, to prosecute the revolution, which took seven years to 1783, and another six years, of course, when they finally formed the more perfect union. Regardless of that fact, the revolution that we're talking about took place in 1776, and the working men had exactly the same status they had before, except that because they gained the status of states, they were no longer subject to British jurisdiction and remote rule from London. And what we have today is, is actually the produce of that because when the, the states are common law democratic organizations, and they were able to achieve, the working men were eventually able to achieve what has been brought about to this day. It could not have happened if we had continued under the rule of Great Britain. So there was something in it for the laboring man. And Joe, you're wrong when you say that a white slave has no interest in that revolution because what you've achieved to this day could not have happened without that revolution. So we are fucked anyway. Hey, Bob. We are fucked anyway. Oh, yeah. But oh, that's the point. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about the point that he said. Why is this? Right now, there's Gene Orker. Revolution style. Why it, please? Why don't that? Everybody's talking If you want to hear more bad news, Look at Boris uh, Boris Berman's book, uh, Why America Failed. But I'm not going to talk about that. It's the big picture. I'm going to talk about the small, a little smaller picture. Uh, at its very best, I guess the idea would be that uh, unions are good for the community. That's the ideal. Part of the problem, I think, with unions is that there are three sections that constitute uh, our society. One is the government, one is the economic sector, and the third is the third sector, the community organizations. Part of the problem in the past has been some unions think they're part of the economic sector. I think that's wrong, and a lot of unions realize that. Bring it down to the local level. There's a union, SEIU, Service Employees International Union. That union seems to believe that it is part of the community. Uh, I'm a member of Jane Adams Senior Caucus, and last uh, November, a bunch of us got arrested. We were arrested because we were uh, fighting for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and HUD funding. You were sitting down the street. There. Right, yeah. I, I, I wasn't lonely, and I'm no big hero. I'm just one of 50 people. That's not the point. The point is... The point is, we had to pay fines of about $5,000. We could have, is that my time? Yeah, so up? Is no, yes, we're we're gonna gonna okay. Uh, we had to pay fines of $5,000. Uh, we, uh, of that, uh, five, uh, so we had to come up with $5,000.
But we didn't have to come up with $5,000 because SEIU came up with the money. Why did a poor union come up with the money? Because we had gone to Springfield to make sure that they get good wages because we want good workers in nursing homes and acuity care program. So again, it comes around to the idea. At its very best, uh, the community needs good unions, and good unions are good for the community. Thank you. Gentlemen in the red uh, shirt, uh, you, you related that exploitation was uh, a thing that uh, is something that has always been and always will be. And uh, here is how to we we have to uh, look at, at some numbers to to decide what do we consider exploitation and what's reasonable. So let's compare to the Western world, to Western Europe, uh, the ratio of uh, a typical CEO compared to the mean worker, the, the average worker, not the lowest worker, employee in the company is between 11% and 12%, depends from England to Germany. Here in this country, it's one to 475 times. I mean, this outrageous. That's one uh, factor. The other one was mentioned here already is the tax structure in which those people pay less than the secretaries. Romney paying 13.9% and we are not even talking about the shelters. And the third factor is that even though the ratio is so low in, in Europe, they also have safety nets. Okay, long <coughs> employment uh, period, healthcare, and other social services. So, um, I think we can call it exploitation. Um, what to do about it is, is, is really, uh, there were some, some ideas from Union and some from Joe, I find it unproductive to start with all the different sections. And when I was uh, in uh, AFSCME, I worked for the state. Also, we were uh, RC63 because we were the professionals, and those are this and that. And you talk about middle class as a false consciousness kind of thing. I, I agree with what happened in the 70s. And what happened there is that we got carried away with what's called the American dream. And the American dream, George Carlin said it beautifully. He said, you, 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 you can believe the American dream only if you are asleep. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, it, they, they, and the issue is that the American dream uh, not only is based on some false values of um, and money is, is God, but also uh, uh, on the um, lack of solidarity, on this competitive um, and, and segregated look at uh, my group and my special interest, the special interest of my group. Um, you know, these times are changing. It's information age now, so there will be the, the difference between blue color and white color is no longer relevant, really, of physical work versus not. And we know here, even in this uh, uh, group, there are people who are professors who are fighting all their lives, all their years, old people who are not getting hired. University don't have to um, um, get them on the um, tenure track and um, they have no safety and, and low wages. So the issue is exploitation of the, I would say, I don't know if it's the 99% or, or 90% and class consciousness has to change with, with exploitation consciousness. Um, 
I think the fact that you, you mentioned authoritarianism as a very, very common trap. And um, I think that's, a, that's something that we need to be at, to address. Uh, religion to, has to be out, Joe. I don't know why do you expect Christianity to, to be better in terms of exploitation and slavery. Um, you know, the Old Testament is based on slavery and authoritarianism is at the base of it. Um, but um, we, we, we have to try with, with consciousness as to um, dissolve all those differences between what kind of work I do or what kind of education the person has uh, and the rest, I don't know. you know me. For anybody here that doesn't know me, my name is Andy Anderson and I run an information service as a hobby, translating books that uh, summarize databases of evidence. Here, uh, we're, ta we're talking about, you know, the overriding theme I've heard tonight. People have been asking questions. What can be done? What can be done? Well, Albert Einstein said it, uh, what, 60 years ago, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure who is winning. Uh, the first step is to stand up and, and face the reality of what's going on around us. And uh, in America, you know, we have people in this audience, regulars, that are incredibly well-informed, intelligent, on various issues, but those incredibly informed people are also simultaneously, terrifyingly, offensively ignorant on basic reality in America. Right. And that is because the American media runs a propaganda program that George Orwell would only dream about. For each, I have a poster usually, uh, it says 10,000 to 1. Well, for each minute of truth on certain subjects we get in the media, we get 10,000 minutes of what I call cribs. That's criminally insane bullshit. Cribs. One minute of truth, 10,000 minutes of cribs. Is it any wonder that we have a segment of the population that thinks teachers make too much money? Let, let's pay them what uh, a worker at McDonald's gets. I mean, we're, we are just inundated with criminally insane bullshit every day, 24-7, from the major media. And if, if we're not going to just give up and let uh, a few rich criminals roll over us, then it's a generational fight. The, uh, the rich people recognize that from 1945 to 1973, this country made tremendous progress. And we had an issue of fairness. I grew up in a family where I watched friends, neighbors, their fathers. The idea was if you worked a 40-hour week, you could support a family and, and have a house. That idea has gone out the window. Uh, and it's crept up on us so slightly because our media has shaped and molded uh, American opinion smoothly since 1973 was the peak year, and that's when a few billionaires got together and said uh, middle class Americans, ordinary working class Americans, have too much wealth and money, we got to start taking it back. And so uh, the, the peak year for the middle class was 1973. We've gone downhill a little bit ever since. No kidding. And for anybody that's interested uh, to understand, here's a book called Do Not Ask What We Do. It's about the current Congress. And, and the first chapter in this book talks about a meeting that took place with 14 of the so-called uh, Tea Party people uh, got together in a very swanky restaurant on the night that President Obama was being inaugurated. These 14 were having dinner and mapping out the plan to destroy the Obama presidency, no matter how many people in America got killed from starvation, lack of medicine, uh, homelessness, didn't matter. Destroy the middle class economy and we'll make Obama a one term president. Tom Hartman was talking about this on the radio a week ago. He had asked people to call in and he says, is there anybody out there that doesn't think that meeting was treason? 
See, when we talk about politicians making mistakes, or we give them credit for being, uh, you know, two sides of the political opinion, or political, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans, we should be, one minute left, we should be talking in terms of treason and crimes against humanity. As far as I know, we're the only country in the world that really tolerates a business owner saying, I got three kids to send to college. I, I can't pay my workers in my, my factory a living wage because I only got twenty-two billion in the bank. I need another forty or fifty yeah. billion before I, my yeah. wife and my three kids can feel secure. See, that's that's <coughs> not greed. That's not corporate greed. That's that's a mental illness, psychopathic tendencies. Mm -hmm. And we've allowed these people to rise to the top without confronting it. Like, you know, she said uh, the ratio of CEO to pay in other countries is 10 to 1, 12 to 1, not 500 to 1 or 1,000 to 1. Start with facing basic reality of what's happening. And you can't learn that by watching the news. You have to look at internet news sites from all over the world. Am I up? Okay. If anybody wants the other information, uh, give me a call or, uh, you know, come see me afterwards. All right. Patrick Boylan, first time at, oh. at, at the podium. I rise to celebrate the Declaration of Independence. Joe, I think that, that you're, uh, you're very poetic, but I think you should embrace what these revolutionaries did in 1776. Wow. In 1775, you and you and you and everybody in this room we were not citizens. We are citizens today. Our rights come from ourselves. Before that, we were subjects. And our rights came from the monarchy. And that was a revolutionary idea. And while we have not fulfilled all of those terms, it continues to be a revolutionary idea today that we are not dependent upon another person for our rights, that our rights come from ourselves. That was a revolutionary idea. They were slave owners. They were the 1%. They owned all the property. They were white. They had no intention of letting women and blacks and anybody else, the Irish, the Germans, anyone, from sharing. Those ideas came later. They came from those guys' thoughts in 1776. And I rise to celebrate it. I'm going to give my rebuttal with a firm qualification that I support Brother Joe and what he's doing with the exploitation of workers at a large company. But I do not think that you should throw out the whole damn system. We call by itself. What part should we say? Yeah. I well, believe that global <laughs> capitalism has been the salvation of humanity. Oh, yeah. One fall at a time. Okay. I believe that global capitalism has delivered the goods yeah. to the rest of the market. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, all you have to do is take a look at the relevant data worldwide over the last 300 to 500 years. And child labor? What were we doing, Charlie, back 300 years ago? Most of you would be peasant farmers under some rich landowner. You would be eking out an existence no longer, no larger than what they're doing now in peasant Africa. Europe, 300 years ago, is at about the same living standards that Africa is today. But what changed? It was called the Industrial Revolution, the standardization of parts, the development of markets, the development of finance and the, employ and the employment of innovation that really started moving society forward. Now, granted, I am not going to sit here and say that the system is all right, that it's all encompassing and going to solve every problem because it doesn't. But it does work when competition is proper, 
when there's a good system of regulation in that regulates the markets against excess. And we've seen this war before. Many of you go back to the 19-teens and the 20s, and what did you have? You had, you had uh, things like uh, the union under Theodore Roosevelt. You had things such as the antitrust laws. You had other things that came in, and plus a lot of what happened is that unions did deliver the goods. They brought wages up. I am not going to say that the American corporation is a humane entity, because in a lot of cases it's not. You need a system of countervailing power called the union to do that. But the only reason these corporations are in business in the first place is because you're supporting them with your dollars, and you're supporting them by buying their goods. Why does a corporation exist? Because it works. A bunch of people who come in with economies of scale, with bringing prices down to competitive pressures, is probably the best way to bring jobs. The best way to rise in a global economic system, and probably the best way to deliver the goods. So with me saying that, you know, all this stuff about socialism is going to work and you want to eliminate exploitation, well, we've tried socialism. We've tried communism. And what's happened is that you've got a government control that works as about just as bad as any major corporation do. It's even worse because it's monopolistic power. When did we try it? Okay. The former Soviet Union, for example. Now, when you want to talk about real solutions to real problems, we're going to have a guy here next week who's going to talk about the demining problem in Cambodia by inventing a machine. And we got another guy who's going to try to fight global warming with another type of nuclear power, which he really needs to talk about. Frank, you may think so, but he's ready. You are full of shit. Well, I may, but I'm also working on it. Frank, because I'm also going to tell you something right now. Don't direct yourself to me. I'm looking right at you and I'm saying I believe in the data. I believe in solutions. I believe that there is a certain way that things work. Believe doesn't work, man. And I also support a lot of my conclusions with the data. Faith is and you're the one who talks about interrupting the speaker all the time. Yeah. You're the hypocrite. You are directing uh -huh. yeah, no, David. Yeah. 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 That's David. Yeah. 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 I have to uh, agree with uh, this gentleman here, Pat, Pat, Pat uh, uh, Yeah, he, he was right on. Uh, all eyes were upon us to see how this experiment would work, uh, giving you know power to the to the people, and uh, and so far it's still worked. And you know all those guys, all those founding fathers, uh, they all had uh, one. One important book uh, they all read in common. Now, besides that book, that, that was true. That's a good answer. That's one book. But another book. Check book. <laughs> no, The Wealth of Nations by Adam oh, Smith. Oh, it was also published in 1776. And that gave. Gave us, you know, that laid down, uh, you know, the necessary, the three really necessary components for for an economy, and you know, the, the founders wanted, uh, you know, they wanted an economic, uh, you know, they wanted an economic plan or an economic system, a functioning uh, system like a functioning economic system. They wanted uh, diplomatic security, and they also wanted. Uh, what's called political unity, and you know those are really the goals of the of the Constitution and the, and the Bill of Rights. Those are the, th the three things they had in mind. And Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations laid down that uh, to have a successful economy, uh, we need 
the division of labor, and we need uh, free trade. And what was the third one? There's three things. Um, Exploitation. No. <laughs> a compliant uh, you know. workforce. What's that? A compliant workforce. Well, <laughs> well it'll, it'll, it'll come to me. But free trade is, is extremely important. Oh, the, the, you need the freedom to, uh, to, uh, to pursue you know, your own self-interest, to enter into voluntary yeah. contracts. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. the thing is, yeah. when, when yeah. people specialize in things, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, it's their division of labor, their productivity zooms, then they have a lot of excess product, and they need to be able to trade that. So that's where free trade comes in. And, you know, it, prior to that time, like in England, they had these, they had these parish laws, and, uh, you know, manufacturer was highly regulated. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you would, if you were a manufacturer, you would pay a bribe to some, uh, King or some courtesan uh, that ruled some area, and you would be you would give you'd be given a uh, you know a monopoly in that particular particular item in that town or or that parish or whatever. Essentially, that's what a union is. A union is really just a that's just a nice word for a cartel. Yeah. Well, well, now, they're they're given a they're given a monopoly on something uh, on labor. They're given a monopoly on labor for a particular company. Yeah. And these parish laws, everything they had in England, were the same were the same uh, way. Uh, they they disallowed. They, they kept they kept tight control on things like apprenticeships. And uh, so you know the number of people allowed to do something would be tightly regulated. And uh, you could not move freely from parish to parish. If there was, you know, high demand, higher demand for your labor somewhere else, you couldn't just move Whoa. move there. It was it was very difficult. You know, <laughs> all kinds of stringent regulations. And if you read book one of Wealth of Nations, you know, Adam Smith goes into those and talks about it in detail. It's really uh, it's really uh, very interesting. But uh, that was an economic Tim, powerhouse. Tim <laughs> Bolger was, was correct though that. That nothing has uh, lifted America, you know, people, not only America, but all over the world, like like capitalism. What's that, Ron? 40 seconds. Um, it's not perfect, and the problem is monopoly in land. You know, if we would address that issue, you know, there's three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Labor... And capital is is virtually infinite, but land is not. And if you go back and read Henry George, read Progress and Poverty, he wanted to go back and look at the you know the source of inequality and trace it back. And what it is 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 land, is landowners, and actually landowning uh, that is there's your there's your non-working class, the landowning class. People like that, that's, it's a privilege, making money on a privilege. You have a piece of paper that says, oh, I have this piece of land, so you have to pay me rent to live, work, or play there. That's that's what we need to address. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go I noticed that our previous speaker did not refer to another pamphlet that came out during the Revolutionary Times. Yeah. And that was Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense. <laughs> and it seems to me that our speaker might benefit from possibly rereading that. <laughs> I should perhaps mention here that my mother was a school teacher. She taught in the Chicago Public Schools. And then she was an active member of the Chicago Teachers Union. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, until 1991 when she retired after 25 years service. And when the union went out, so did she. And she walked the picket lines. I'm a card-carrying member of Local 700 of the Teamsters Union. And when I had problems with a nasty and invasive supervisor, my union helped me out. And that's why I'm going to be able to retire in September after 30 years of service with a full pension. So I don't want to hear some jive about how unions are monopolies and don't, we don't need unions. Yeah, we do. There was a time in this country when the people who worked in the cigar factories didn't get paid in cash. 
they got paid in cigars. <laughs> and now we can laugh, but to put food on the table after they finished their work in the cigar factory, they then had to take those cigars out and peddle them in order to get money to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. Or the most shit upon minority in this country, miners. The folks in the coal mines, well, if they got fired, they lost not only their job, but their house in the company town. Mm -hmm. And it was a long way to the nearest town that wasn't a union town. And their name got put on a blacklist so they weren't hired by any other mines. Don't and, forget the uh, black lung. That's right. And in addition to that, during the Depression, we heard much about how you weren't free to move around, that the logic contained in, well, in the Wealth of Nations changed all this. Well, in the Depression, when a textile miner was, or a textile worker was laid off in New England, and he went to another town to find work, the sheriff of that town picked him up and drove him back to his own hometown. He wasn't wanted in another town. We heard earlier how, from Ayala about how George Carlin articulated the American dream. Well, she was right, and he also articulated it in another way when he wrote a book that was entitled, When Will Jesus Bring the Pork Chops? <laughs> we also heard about John Brown. Now, John Brown was a murderer if ever there was one. But as Bruce, the great Civil War historian Bruce Catton pointed out, slavery had one particularly maddening quality. It ennobled anyone who fought it, John Brown included. And that's why I, along with other people, cherish the memory of John Brown. Let's see here. Oh, yes. Then there was the issue of fascism when World War II came up. I would say rather that <laughs> President Roosevelt realized early on the dangers of fascism. But he was handicapped by the fact that the American people were staunchly isolationist and wanted no part of any problems in Europe. For them, for many people in this country, Europe was the hateful place that their ancestors had fled. And they felt that they had been, that they felt that this country had been, uh, how shall I say this, had been uh, treated disrespectfully at the Versailles Peace Conference. The President Wilson's ideas were spat, and they wanted no part of that in the future. I don't agree with their logic, although I understand it, but nevertheless, it was that and not because of any any, sort of any, staunch, any closet sympathy for Nazi and fascism that President Roosevelt held back. I've, all right, since I've got only half a minute left, I'm going to try and speed some of this up here. On, Harry Truman denounced the Taft-Hartley Act, which he vetoed. He, <clears throat> when the Republicans charged that he had tried to put labor in change, he addressed an audience in Pittsburgh and said, how do you think the Republicans came to the rescue of labor? They did it with the Taft-Hartley law. <laughs> and I would say that based on a report on CBS News, sea levels folks yes. are already rising, as several communities on the East Coast have already found out. That's it.
means of production are the nub of what social relations are all about. How in a capitalist society the means of production are owned by the capitalists. And in order to live, people have to be employed by the capitalist, by the capitalist class, the owners of the means of production and distribution. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're swaining and straining and sweating, uh, whether you to be a worker, you you have to give your labor time to the capitalist. Now, you can be a nurse, in which case you work in a hospital. The hospital is owned by. God knows whom. Uh, very often they're owned by insurance companies. Uh, but uh, Catholic Church. But whoever, or, or, or maybe just a set of doctors uh, who uh, capitalized it uh, uh, from the beginning. But usually there were collections made. Collections were made through churches, uh, through synagogues, through institutions in a community. That's where Gene Harker's uh, communities come in. The community. Basically, it all do does come down to communities people working together, living together, understanding that they have some common interests, whether it's, we're all Americans here, yeah. or all Chicagoans, or all living in the catchment area of a hospital. So, but the ownership and control of the hospital is in the hands of certain people, and they see that the hospital has to prosper, it has to make uh, a profit in order to expand that exists. If it doesn't expand, if there isn't an <coughs> accumulation of capital, oh my God, I won't have a minute left, the hospital will go under. It will be outdone by its competitors. So the people who run the institution set out to make a, a profit. And that means they have to watch every worker to see that they are working productively and efficiently and that there is a profit and they cannot be paid too much. If they are paid too much, well, there go the profits. So there is a class war that goes on every day in every hospital and everywhere else in our communities. No Jesus today. No Jesus today. No Jesus? I'll give you some Jesus, Frank. Bible yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker here. Oh my good health, oh my good health. Let's thank you. Take it line here. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Um, 
Let's collected. see here. <laughs> he briefly you talked about constitutional rights. Uh, and you're entirely correct. Uh, you have those those are virtually non existent. As I say, once you cross the portal of the workplace, um, those rights dissipate. I actually have written on that and researched it, and I'm going to look it up on Monday. Uh, what, where I approached this topic was what were the rights of employees who were not recognized under, under a, a union contract. And we tried to expand upon those. That's what a union contract does. The only rights you have are rights, quite frankly, that are defined by law, and I mean specifically labor law, or supplemented by another feature. I like to think of it as law as a union contract. A lot of people look at the monetary aspects of union contracts, and as a negotiator for quite a few years, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that means nothing. It's the job securities incorporated in that 90, 90, the other 90% of that contract. That's what you've got to focus on. Nothing matters other than job security. Um, I can think of no other, other thing that rises higher to that in any degree of importance or concern. Monetary things and so forth are here and there that can be dealt with in other fashion. But uh, the condition of unemployment is one that is rather severe. Um, you, you like agitation, Joe. I call it, you, you can do a lot of things in support of a grievance. Uh, it certainly gets their attention. Uh, a lot of constraints and they've handcuffed the unions. We can't even do boycotts. Even common side is picketing, anything like that. A lot of that's been taken away from us. And the end result is they try to decertify unions as a result if you try to engage in any of this. It's a real precarious course. But nevertheless, it's there. Regarding solidarity, you did hit on something there. There's nothing more greater solidarity than among the management that operates this nation and the multinational corporations that our friend Tim here seems to think are so wonderful. Uh, what we're confronted with, I always say, how do I get solidarity? I've got a guy who's a captured piece, I call it. He's got a hacienda that he can't afford and two or three kids and an old Plymouth. You know, I'm supposed to, exact, supposed to get them, like Joe says, in engaging in agitation. I don't know what the issue is that would be the threshold that's going to get me to do that. Also, I don't understand why we have to go to the press of the community and things like this. That's a whole other issue here. This community-based organizing and things like this. I think these issues should be settled among the parties at the table. And not in the press and the media and things like that, but I guess we can't choose that field of endeavor. That's what the public sector is facing here. What the heck is the public doing on these issues? I mean, we have grievance arbitration process and arbiters and things like that and um, courts to resolve these issues and I don't know how we got in this marketplace of idea and this combating, what are, what are we in the media business or something? I don't understand where that came from. Last of all, though, I always like to take something with me here. Um, by the way, that's absolute cap. I'm going to talk on the American Revolution here. That's absolute nonsense that we fought only for some arcane aspect of getting rid of the British and British because they had oppressive maritime commercial laws. The men fought at Valley Forge and were freezing <laughs> <laughs> because their economic uh, statutes of the crown were too oppressive. I mean, there was rebellion. 25,000 Americans died in the American Revolution. They didn't fight for some abstract commercial laws, Bob. The oldest social movement in the United States is the organized labor movement. And it began many, many years before. It began in 1492. I mean, this goes back. There were all sorts of things like that. But nothing you do. This is this is really narrow scope interpretation of, of history. Like this is a, this is the history of people, not, not, not some uh, abstractions here. And last of all, though, we've got to find out where they got these warehouses of money. That's what we got to focus on. <laughs> it's our goal, folks. It's our goal. But anyhow, come again, Joe. Thanks a lot. All right, Phil. I don't have my...
have a book synopsis here tonight. Uh, I think that's basically what it's going to take to. And, uh, I don't think you think that would answer quite all the questions that came up tonight. But uh, I do think that uh, there are a few things that, that do have to be said. Uh, just exactly what is exploitation? Is there some standard? You just think it's, 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 it's the seat of the pants type of a an evaluation? Do you think somebody's getting exploited? What's the alternative? Is there some other way of uh, getting that person more money other than uh, you talk about, uh, is, is, is the union the only alternative to exploitation? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, we heard, I'll tell you what, we heard uh, the reference to uh, uh, employers driving down wages when there's too many workers. How come there aren't more employers to drive up the work? Drive up wages, but uh, we didn't get into it tonight. But uh, there is such a thing as the employer capitalist union. I want to keep capital in short supply. <laughs> you mean, you know, how you guys? You know, you guys don't like being paid in cigars. I, I you like uh, if you couldn't get paid until the product was sold. That's what happens when capital is not happening to capital. We can't pay you once or twice a month. And, you know, before the product is sold. Thank you very much. But I think, I think the concept that needs to be injected into this discussion is that of economic calculation. It's not an easy doc, uh, doc idea to explain. But it, it, it has something to do with you know, what, what, where, where prices come from. As far as that matter, where do jobs come from? You don't you just you take these as given quantities. Where do they come from? What's the facts of life? Where do they come from? Why would anybody want to hire some you union heads around here? <laughs> When they do on one and everything, well, I don't know. Maybe this is my way of being eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that yeah, talk about discussions being constrained by prevailing ideas and so on. I think I think we have that even here at the college of complexes. Speaker gets the last word. Solidarity forever, Joe. No, man, everybody was all over the board over a lot of stuff. I uh. like to read my notes over here. I'm going to take off my glass. But, uh, yeah, all that plastic shit. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, another, I mean, there's so many different um, issues that you know get uh, to be active and involved in. And what I need, what people need to do is take action. You know, I mean, I'm I'm involved in so many different things. My labor is my strong suit, though, and that's where my passion is. So that's where I'm mostly focused and involved. And I'm a teamster, so you know, I work at UPS. So that's my struggle is the contract campaign, being a steward on the shop floor. But I mean, the environment is probably the most important issue. You know we have. You know we're going to be. You know facing extinction. You know eventually. You know every everything dies and nothing's forever. But we're going to be facing extinction sooner than later if we don't change this. You know rampant consumerism and just. I mean like for example Christmas. You know we buy all these presents and we want to care about the people. You know we love and buy them this and buy them that. But most of that that shit ends up in the garbage. You know not much longer. It's just it's just shit. You know plastic shit. Uh, plastic shit. Vinyl shit. Whatever kind of shit, it's all, you know. You see, I, I, I tend not to curse for much, but once it started, it's hard to stop, you know. But it, it's basically, you know, garbage. 
I mean, I got console model TVs at home where I can set my VCR on top of. So I mean, somebody breaks into my house, I think, I think there ain't too many things worth stealing. I got a boom box, you know, uh, I think that's the only thing new is my laptop. But I mean, I guess I get an Android phone, I guess I'm behind on times with that too. But I mean, just this rampant consumerism. You know, we just gotta always have this new thing, the new thing, until before the old one even breaks. I mean, I don't even watch my console model TV because I don't even get service. Because, man, I've been fighting all these corporations that provide, whether it's, it's uh, cable or, um, or satellite, you know, I had my ins and outs and my fights with them, so eventually, you know, I, I didn't pay them for, you know, the bogus service, and now I probably burn bridges with every cable company and, <laughs> and uh, any, every, uh, you know, satellite provider. Okay. Capitalism is dying, you know. You know, that's, uh, I'm pretty sure of that. The problem is what's going to be replaced with it, just like it happened in Germany. Are we going to get fascism, or are we going to have some a move to a more, a more equitable, more just society where everybody gets a fair share? And that's what we need to organize in, as you know, as we get limited resources. It's going to be a fight, and we need to be organized for our, our mutual self-defense. You know, and what they're going to do is divide and conquer. They're going to, you know, one of the old industrialists said, you know, you can hire half, half the working class to kill the other half of the working class. No, no, it was, it was an industrialist that said that. Back in the day. But any, there you go, that guy. That guy, all right. So, I mean, that's what we need to be prepared for that. And just like the struggles I was talking about, I didn't get a chance to mention the Tinley Part 5. The Tinley Part 5, um, they were uh, basically charged with mob action, but there were some white supremacists having their organizational, whatever thing they were doing. So they showed up there with uh, allegedly hammers and ass, ass like retractable billy clubs and gave them heck and charged them rent. Whatever, you know, fascism or white supremacism or Nazism or whatever show up, it needs to be stomped out before it spreads like a cancer. Um, but yeah, now let's talk about nothing in, in uh, in 1776, I said nothing was good. Well, I mean, it was, you know, Frederick Douglass's speech that I was uh, given, you know, in the beginning. So there might have been, a, it's coming from that perspective, and, you know, coming from me might be a little bit hyperbole, if you will. But, I mean, the revolution in 1776 was in, a, in advance, you know, as far as, per se, getting rid of, rid of the king. It's, it's, it was advanced, it was worth fighting. But, you know, in... Like people were saying, the people, the 25,000 died or whatever. They were fighting for freedom. They were fighting, they're thinking that they were going to get something better. You know, you know, the poor folk, working folk, they got involved in this. But when everything's said and done, they had no, you know, the working folk had no improvement in their material conditions in the country. I mean, and, you know, a bunch of people mentioned stuff, you know, so I don't want to feel like I'm stealing from them, but I mean, this is all stuff I heard too. I mean, England ended slavery before the United States. You know, the working conditions in England are more progressive than the working conditions in the United States. And they came out of the, you know, that Victorian England. They got better laws and stronger unions. They got a labor party. Well, I mean, it's not a labor party, but it's still more progressive than the Democrats we have here, to some extent. Um, but man, people is all over the board, so let me uh, see where I'm going. Uh, Oh, okay, somebody was talking about the, gov the, 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 the tri part of this country, country, the government, the economic, and the community. And they were saying how the uh, unions you know, were looking more as economic than instead of community. But, I mean, like, like they try to third party the unions, they try to third party the public sector workers, you know, as, you know the greedy sec uh, public sector workers. I mean, who, who is more part of the community than the public sector workers? We're providing healthy, you know, need, you know, benefits, you know, for, for the the community. And what does a corporation do when it privatizes? It's not about providing a service. At that point, it's about providing a profit when they privatize it. You know, what's the thing about the private? Every time they privatize, the quality of service goes down and the cost goes up because it's for a, pro a profit for the CEOs and the stockholders. And, and, and when it's for not for profit. The purpose of it is to serve the public. So, I mean, I prefer government over corporations every time. But the problem is the rich control the government and the corporations, but we're able to more put pressure on government institutions because, 
at least has an illusion of democracy as opposed to corporations, which is a top-down run organization. So, I mean, but there's still pressure we can do there, general strikes, so on and so forth. There's, there's pressure, to, you know, there's levers and points all along the way, but it's easier to pressure the government than a corporation. But trying to cover everybody, but um, let me see. Um, I'll talk about uh, what's um, exploitation and what's reasonable. I mean, if this system could be reasonable, we, would, we wouldn't need unions. I mean, but the thing is, like for example, if there was something called a reasonable profit, capitalism is, is allowed something called a reasonable profit, maybe the bigger the company, the smaller this reasonable profit would be. Mom and pop shop would probably need a higher profit margin to function, but a, you know, a multi-billion dollar company, you could function on a 1% profit. Um, whatever, but I mean, what is all corporate profit? When everything's said and done, you look at it one or two ways, you know, but it comes down the same way. You can either look at it, one, they're overcharging the consumer, you know, or two, they're not paying the worker you know, from all the wealth he's created. But who are the consumers? The workers. <laughs> and we're, you know, they're not going to have anybody consuming anything if keep on, the, the, the money is keep on going higher and higher and up to the top. It's the point that workers don't have to buy, have any money to buy what what they're uh, what what they're what, what they're they're creating. So then you won't have any consumers left. Because I mean the rich guys, I mean they might buy a few extra cars, but they can only drive so many cars at once and get so much gas and eat so much food and so on and so forth. Um, you gotta get an elevator in your garage. Yeah, you can get an elevator. You can get an elevator in your garage. You know to get your cars in and out. I heard that one before. <laughs> Okay. And now I want, I want to address some some of the issues brought up about um, middle class and uh, working class. And I think my uh, position was a little bit misunderstood. I mean, there's white collar jobs and there's blue collar jobs, and both of them don't have to be. Both of them can be working class, you know, and um, not middle class. Because I mean, what de defines working class? is you're doing labor, you're not supervising or owning or making your money from rent. That's it. What you make the majority of your income from. But of course, I'm partial to working, I'm partial to blue collar. I mean, I do physical manual labor for my job. But like somebody who's in an office working on a computer, but you know, and they're, they're in a little cubicle punching in, they got their own workers' issues. You know, they might have bad chairs or hurt their back. They might be getting, you know, problems with their eyes from looking at the computer or, or the the ergonomics of, you know, the way the computer station is set up. I mean, they're still working class. It is, but I mean, but I'm a little partial, you know, you know, just, you know, sweating. Look, when, you know, I'm uh, shucking 50, 150 pounds from my hips on down, they raised the weight to 150 pounds at UPS. It was like a one day strike back then saying we can get help with anything over 70 pounds. But I mean, you know, working class is that you, you work for a living, and I mean, I maybe went too, you know, went, well, I mean, not too far, but manual labor, it's, it's labor, you know, not supervising. Supervising and managing is not labor, it's exploiting labor. And, you know, and, I, and they, well, they try to obfuscate the lines, you know, at work, you know, you know management will tell a worker, go tell somebody else to do something. No, they, I mean, that's, that's their job to tell somebody else to do something because then you try to draw the lines or they'll, you know, they'll come down and sort a few packages. And then the person help, you know, work, you know, the worker thinks management is helping them because they're getting overwhelmed. But, I mean, if, if you allow that to happen, if you don't, you know, let, you know, let your steward know to file that grievance, what's going to stop them from keep on doing it? They're not going to hire any more people if, you know, you're going to let them, let them work or, or anything like that. Um, what else we got here to cut? We'll cut make sure I uh, let. Well, $100,000 Yeah, hundred thousand uh, dollars a year is not unreasonable. If wages kept up with production, a hundred thousand dollars a year would be um, so-called American dream, so-called American uh, middle class. That wage or whatever, you know, there'll be nothing wrong. I mean, for example, I bought a house only working. I was like maybe five years at. Uh, UPS part time. I bought a house. I mean, it's in a rough neighborhood. We got we got the lights on, you know, the cameras and the lights in the next block over. What I say is we don't have them on our block, so we're t we're so tough on our block, we just tear it down. Okay, there's prostitution, dope dealing, that kind of stuff. 
You know, there's to be four bars in every block, you know what I mean? I call that labor too. What? That's labor too. Right, right, but it's it is it's very exploitive labor. And based on what I said earlier, we're prostituting ourselves, selling our labor to the highest bidder. But it's more honest labor. But you know, it should be now for example, um, what happens at the bunny ranch is not the same thing, you know, what, you know, that happens at on, you know, a girl working on the street corner. There's, there's, de there's degrees of exploitation and it degrees of safety and all that kind of stuff. And um, but what I'm saying is, you know, I got the, all that in, in the neighborhood and the community. And uh, they made the cul de sacs to end, you know, in the block and then, the, then, then it moves on to the next block. But, uh, that wasn't but anyhow, um, I'm trying. Oh yeah, uh, one, one thing I wanted to cover is the mental slavery that uh, one individual brought up. Now, people don't need to wear any chains if they're mentally enslaved. You know, I mean that's the that's the hardest people to free if their mind is enslaved. So we've got people working for eight fifteen hours, thinking they deserve that's all they deserve yeah. in the way the system and they brainwash people from birth. You know. Um, you know, from the, the corporate media, and if, if you know, in your parents, if in your parents are brainwashed, then they're brainwashing their children. What we need is strong militant teacher unions to educate, educate the, uh, the the people of the true history of the United States. This history, of the United States, is not one of one big happy family. It's more been a struggle and exploitation of one one class exploiting the other class throughout this history. The only way we get anything is through struggle, whether Fighting the corporations, you know, fighting the government to get a fair shake. You know, I'm not saying um, Roosevelt was a fascist, but our but our institution and government didn't care enough about getting the world free of fascism. That once the war was over, Spain was still standing as a fascist country, and uh, I don't think it would be too difficult, you know, at that point to run through us. We were up to Spain, Spain at that time. Thank you, Joe. All right. Wrong lonely and slave. Thank you all for coming. All right. Uh, right. Let's let the, uh, so the, the workers who. Bring us our